What's up, 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 what is up? How are y'all doing today? It is Friday, and y'all know what that means. It means we're going to have us a good old time tonight. I am your host, Emmanuel E-Man Noisette, and I want to welcome each and every one of you for hanging out with your boy, and thank you guys so much in advance for giving me your time and hanging out with me. Um, in case you're new, guess what? We are going to cover a lot of the news from the week. Um, I am going to react to a bunch of different things that happened. We got a bunch of trailers um, that came out. I'm going to be talking about uh, the Acolyte and I want to say Alien. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get some of the other trailers because YouTube is going to shut down the channel, you know, or close down the live if I do it for copyright reasons. So we're not going to react to those. Um, but we also have a bunch of updates from behind the scenes stuff going on at Marvel. So we'll talk about that. Um, I definitely got to give you all my thoughts. We have to we have to talk about X-Men 97. Um, so we're going to at the end of this, we will be doing uh, just a quick reaction, you know, just a quick reaction, not a full breakdown of episodes one and two of X-Men 97. Um, and yeah, and then we got some other things. We got some updates, some new movies coming out, uh, some new things to go through. So we'll go through all of that stuff. Um, and shout out to those of y'all that are watching on the replay. I really, really appreciate y'all. You guys have really been showing up. Um, and, and the support is ridiculous. So I want to thank you guys. Special shout out to uh, Mambo Jazz. My man be coming on the replays, hitting that thank you button and showing some love and support. Thank you, brother. I always appreciate it. Uh, matter of fact, I got to give another quick thank you to hold on one second. Uh, guys, I want y'all all to come together and give a quick thank you to low key. Thank you so, so much for the uh, $25 cash app and for keeping the channel ad free. So we ain't got to be bothered with the ad. So thank you so, so much, low key for your contribution and shout out to everyone that supports this channel in any way, shape or form. Um, all right, so let's do some. Oh, before I go, uh, in case you do want to participate, by by the way, you can always leave your comments and stuff wherever you like, but the place to be is really on YouTube. So if you come on over to the YouTube channel, you too can be a part of the eFam and and you know have your comments be shown, um, or at least participate with others um by just subscribing to the channel. Uh, it's free 99 now. I'm not charging you a dime. So all you got to do is subscribe and you too can be a part of the conversation. Uh, let's see who was here early. I want to see who was here early and give y'all some quick shout outs um, just to show my appreciation. We got my man Ism. What is going on? Good to see you, boss. Thank you so much for being here. Wouldn't be alive without Ms. Hopper. Thank you so much, man, for being here. Appreciate you. Mr. Mitchell, appreciate you as well. Thank you so much. We got the homie Zia Latrice back in action. Rabia, what is going on? Uh, you going to catch a replay. All good. Thank you so much for being here either way. Didier, what is up, my man? How you doing? Uh, Latrice, good to see you. Shar, good to see you as well. Samantha, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Did I watch X-Men 96? Come on now. Did I watch? Of course. Come on now. <laughs> Minister Crush, what's going on? Thank you so much for being here. 60 plus, thank you so much. Come on now. We got the superstar low key. Appreciate you so much for being here. Mama Jay is in the building. Good to see you as well. My man Jay, what is up, brother? Good to see you. Uh, let's see. Gray, how you doing? Good to see you as well. Uh, Tasha, what is up? Uh, my man Nelson V is here. Thank you so much. Uh, at least, listen, listen. I know we give Nelson some grief, rightfully so. But if my man is watching X Men '97, I'm I'm gonna just say you can release a little bit of the pressure. Like it, this, I'm proud of you, Nelson. I'm proud of you. Yeah, yeah. At least are watching current stuff. So at, you know, you still got your work to do. Now, now we're not gonna forget. You still got Blade 1 and Blade 2 and the Raid 1 and the Raid 2. We're not going to forget, but at least you're watching some quality with X-Men 97. But we'll get to that later. So shout out to you for that. We got my website here. Come on through the movie blog. Y'all make sure y'all go give that a subscribe real quick. Great stuff coming out from there. And make sure you go follow our website as well, themovieblog.com. Uh, shout out to them. Uh, let's see. Treese is here. What is going on? Good to see you. T-Ville. How you doing? Thank you so much. My man Tane is here. Good to see you, brother. Eric, good to see you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, MC, how you doing? Uh, thank you so much for being here. 
Uh, who else we got? We got the homie Rhonda's back. Always a pleasure. My man Johnny Washington's here. Good to see you. Uh, Tasha, how you doing? Good to see you as well. Uh, who else I saw? Let me see. Let me see. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sim, good to see you again. Thank you so much. My man Raymond is back. Callow, how you doing? Cal Payne, how you doing? Antoine, good to see you, brother. Uh, let's see. My man Theo is back. Kristen, I see you as well. Corey, how you doing? What's going on, Dre? Thank you so much. Kiki West, the homie. Good to see you. And shout out to everyone that has made it out tonight, guys. I really, really appreciate y'all. Um, I'm gonna try to get through as many things as I can because we do have a lot to go through. But let me uh let's see. Oh my gosh, hold on, man. Um I is Minister Crush coming through. I was about to say the government name. I don't listen. If y'all don't want your government name said, let me know. <laughs> you know, because if I can't tell, I would just be like, oh, John Doe, thank you. So, so just in case, just in case y'all don't want y'all government names out there, just let me know before you know if you send a note or anything like that and uh any uh payments. But thank you so much to Minister Crush for the $50 cash app. And once again, as he says. Uh, for ad free is the way to be. Thank you guys so much. Again, y'all are the reason why we don't have no ads on here. Cause what for? You know, if y'all if this is supported by y'all, listen, that's enough for me. So thank you so so much. All right, let's see. Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna try to get through some of these, and I might have to save some of these for a little later. But let's go through a couple of these real quick. Jarrell, let's get an EFAM. Haven't seen Roadhouse yet. Don't know if it's good, but it looks like a stinky movie. Can someone in the chat confirm? So I just got done watching Roadhouse. Um, it's fine. It's fine. For what it is, given how um, it's on streaming, for those of y'all that are curious, it's on uh, Amazon. Uh, yeah, it's on Prime Video right now. Um, it was fine to me. Like, Jake was great with his you know action scenes conor mcgregor was funny you know with his uh like he's like just this weird crazy villain um so he was cool there action is cool there's some quirky campy 80s kind of humor um i wouldn't say that it lives up to the original but it's fine for something that's on streaming that you ain't got to get up go pay 20 bucks in the theater for it was all right so i enjoyed it you know it I would say check it out if you are remotely interested. Um, but thank you so, so much for that uh, support. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nelson. Ah, I, I don't remember where I got. Let me see if I remember where I got this from. Um, hold on. I might be able to hook you up real quick. Let's see. Let's see. Did I get it? I don't think I got it. I don't think I got it even from Amazon. I'd have to look and see, but I don't I don't know. But you know, listen, that's my girl right there. Storm is that she is that goddess right there. So you know I had to represent today, but I'll see if I can find it and let you know. Appreciate you either way. Uh Eric, thank you so much, man, for the uh contribution. I don't know if you had a comment following that or not. Uh let me scan real quick to see uh maybe it got lost hold on let's see let's see did you retype it maybe let's see if i could scroll i don't see it but thank you so much brother i appreciate you uh either way um let's see ill what you got uh what's up e-man i'm officially out of my 20s and now beginning my 30s today i'm 30 years old yo happy birthday to you ill magic um i hope that you have a fantastic birthday um welcome to the 30s um, I'm almost on my way out. <laughs> you know, I'm getting I'm on the tail end now. Um, but yeah, welcome to the 30s. Um, let me just give you one piece of unsolicited advice. Uh get as much sleep as you can. Okay. Listen, I'm telling you right now, staying up late is for suckers. Okay. Sleep is gonna be your best friend. And uh make sure, please make sure you don't fall asleep in the wrong position. OK, don't, don't listen, don't get off the couch. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you get the right pillows. Invest, invest in a solid mattress. Make sure that mattress got all the cushions. It's got all the, the whatever, all the pillows, all the duck hair, whatever it is. Make sure you don't fall asleep wrong because it will jack you up for the next four weeks. 
You know, just one day of just, mm, ah, mm, ah, you're just going to wake up funny. Okay, so it's going to start soon. Listen, you're going to start waking up and just getting out of bed, making noises for no reason. Just, mm, ah, just, just to stand up. So, you know, enjoy your time, brother. Enjoy your time. But I'm just trying to warn you ahead of time. Drink your water. You know what I'm saying? Sleep right and uh, and eat right. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, uh, happy birthday to you. Hope you have a wonderful time. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Anthony, what you got? Here for the replay tomorrow. All good. Nine weeks out. I got to do stand-up at a NYC comedy club last week and killed it. Congratulations. That is awesome. Listen, stand-up is not for the faint of heart. Um, that definitely takes a lot of guts. So, yo, that is awesome. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Marcus, man, my man, Marcus, what is going on, brother? To me, my EFAM, love it. Uh, been riding the replay for so dang long. Glad I could catch uh, the live. Miss you guys. Uh, of course, uh, got to check in. AOE, how you doing, bro? Bro, I am good. I am chilling. Um, you know what I'm saying? I've been actually uh able to uh do a little bit better on the health end and everything been trying to you know uh, uh watch what i eat a little bit more been you know getting in the gym a little bit you know getting a little get, you know pushing a little weight around you know get kind of getting back into the flow you know it's been a long time since i've been in the gym so i've been having a good couple of weeks you know trying to get right so i'm i'm okay but brother how are you doing let me know how things are going on your end as well but thank you so much for checking in definitely appreciate you um let's see nelson what you got uh haven't forgot i'm a 90s kid who won't miss x-men 97 that's what i like to hear i like to hear that thank you so so much uh let's see um what is this? Uh, it was only for a few minutes, but it was nerve wracking. Anyway, are you going to talk about Quiet on the set? No, I am not going to talk about Quiet on the set because I haven't seen it yet. So um, I, I've heard that was the Nickelodeon uh, documentary, I believe. I haven't uh, watched it yet. So um, it's from what I've seen and heard a little bit. It's very disturbing and very messed up. But, you know, um, yeah, I, I'm not talking about that today. But thank you so, so much um marcus in your 30 snap crackle and pop ain't just for your cereal yeah, this is facts this is facts uh let's see um uh it's sheed e-man bless your boy with a b-day shout out please and i appreciate the b-day shout out in the chat yo it's sheed happy birthday to you i love the fact that everybody's celebrating these days um shout out to y'all this is awesome awesome i hope you have a wonderful fantastic time and enjoy yourself please please do um and and definitely uh uh you know enjoy the day but thank you so much for the support man uh let's see uh oh hold on now sim what you got now get getting in this because i have to uh get back to cooking dinner cooking having an adult beverage with being with the efam live is becoming one of my favorite activities thanks as always sim let me just say right now you already messed up you, you you already messed up you know don't get me wrong now i appreciate the support all day and i agree with you having a good old meal while we sitting here chit chatting about movies and stuff is great but you made one mistake how you gonna sit here tell us last week that you had a whole brand new kitchen which is great but you're not gonna tell us what you eating you're not gonna tell us what you fixing i'm just saying Sam, what happened I know we not. It's bad enough we not gonna eat dinner with you. You know, it's bad enough we not gonna partake in the meal. You can't let people know what's for dinner. I'm just saying, Sil. What happened? I just, you know, what did we have last time? Wasn't this some 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 Cajun fish or something? I don't know. It, I don't know. It was something delicious. But I just want to know what's for dinner. That's all I want to know. Uh, but thank you so much, Sim. I appreciate you. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay, we'll save that for later. Save that for later. Uh, okay, so I was I see the other ones. I will get to them, um, but we do have to get to them, and I'll save those. Uh, we'll save those for a little bit later on. So quickly, we've got some movie updates. Um, probably just some quick things that we will go through. Nothing too major. Um, now you know, let's go. The, apparently, we're getting updates for uh, uh for us in the older generation, I guess. Um, but we got another remake coming. 
and that is going to be from a classic favorite cartoon um at least like it's an old old school cartoon i don't even know you know you you might have to be over the age of 40 to really like this um but popeye yes it looks like popeye the sailor man is getting a live action film in development um and that is going to be coming sometime in the future um but it looks like that is currently in the works and for those of y'all that remember the last time we had a popeye live action um movie that was with you know late great uh robin williams who i thought did a fantastic job with the movie um i can't tell you if that movie was good or not um i just know i just remember seeing him in the role and i was like that's popeye like he got it you know because you know robin williams could do the imitation he could get the like he could do all the stuff just perfectly um, so I was sold right there. So my thing is like, who y'all finna get to play Popeye? Because if it, if that person does not get the very you know specific mannerisms of Popeye and that classic voice, throw this away. You know. Now here's the other question: Is this gonna work? Is there still a demand for Popeye to for for a movie? Man, I hope this is gonna be a low budget thing because I'm just saying I don't know if there's a lot of. I mean, is there a lot of demand for this? Because this is old. This is a very old cartoon. And I, I, listen, maybe it's still cool for the executives that are running these studios or whatever, and maybe it's fond for them. But I'm like, if you're going to bring something back, at the very least, you should have had some stuff in the modern age to connect newer audiences you know it's kind of like um mario or even barbie those were successful successful franchises because no matter what age you are you listen i'm still buying my girls barbie dolls um kids today whether you're an adult or a child people are still playing mario kart or mario games so all that stuff no matter how long it's been it makes sense when you make a movie of it but Popeye, man, I ain't seen a Popeye cartoon. I ain't seen a Popeye movie in years. The last thing that Popeye did that I cared about was come out with a chicken sandwich. Okay, that was the last Popeye anything related that I cared about. But I don't know. Maybe y'all feel a little differently. Do y'all like the idea of um, a Popeye movie? Is this something that you will be checking for? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, now, in addition to that, there is another remake that is coming out, um, and I will say that it has my attention, um, and I don't know about y'all, I never read the books or anything, but I did watch the movies for sure, and that is The Never Ending Story. Um, the Never Ending Story. Y'all remember that, right? So The Never Ending Story is getting a new film series adaptation uh, and that will be coming to theaters um, at some point or or possibly streaming. Not really sure which one, um, but they are looking to do a new uh, series of this. And it looks like it's going to be multiple movies at that. So now, you know, I'll be honest. Listen, <clears throat> as as an 80s baby, 90s kid, I watched the never ending story and I watched both parts. I think I like part one more than I like part two. To this day, I don't think I could tell you what the hell that movie was about, okay? All I know is about a book, a kid getting read a bedtime story, imagination, and uh, uh, what was the, what was the, the, dang it, what was the, the dragon called? What was his name? I forget his name. Y'all remember. Y'all can put it in the comments. What was the dragon, the dog dragon's name? Um, but I remember when I saw him on uh on the movie what was it falcor falcor thank you falcor scared the mess out of me i was like why is he so big why his eyes so big i know he wasn't meant to be scary but i just had a certain fear of like mm, i'm not riding that mm -mm, no that dog at that you know little me that dog is too big i'm not riding that thing no thank you but but then we went on and then we saw (sighs) 
Then the horse. I don't I I don't think it was fair for them to do us like that with the horse. What was his name? A tracks, R tracks, something like that. I you know, as a kid, I was sitting there watching, you know, Care Bears and Ninja Turtles, and I I was like, why can't why can't y'all pull the horse out? Like Just, just, just pull the horse. Just, just pull the horse, man. Ah, ah. Okay, we're not gonna go there. But yeah, that, 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 that unnecessarily messed me up. I, I was not prepared for that as a kid. Um, and then, oh, the nothing. When I tell you, I used to watch that movie like this. That nothing was scary. As a look, I was like, I'm not messing with that nothing. I don't care what magical weapons this little kid got. That nothing? I was like, you know what? That's a good boy. Stay right there. I'm just going to leave. Princess will be all right. The the prince, forget the princess. She will be all right. I'm going to just go over there. You know, I'm sorry to disturb your peace. You want to destroy everything? Oh, well. You know, I tried. You know, but anyway, I used to like... um. I used to really like the never ending story again, even though I never knew as a kid what was really going on. I just kind of went with it anyway. Um, but I don't know, maybe uh, I'll, I'll rewatch it like as an adult, because that was something that I, I used to like to let it live in my head rent free. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't want to go back and watch it as an adult and see all the mistakes or whatever. I didn't want to do that. I just want to let it live in peace. Uh, but y'all let me know. Do you want to see a film series? I mean, think about I'll put this out there. I'll put this out there. If we're getting a never ending story remake, if we're getting a new film series, I think it would be you would have my absolute attention and probably even my money without even a trailer to be seen if you get Denis Villeneuve to do those movies. Because I'm sitting here thinking, like, yo. If you're talking about imagination, if you're talking about spectacle, if you're talking about something to be seen on a big screen, what that man just did with Dune 2, if you put him in charge of the, the never-ending story, I think you got a winner. I think you got a winner on your hands because the one thing you don't want, and listen, I'm not trying to put my sister down, but we don't want a wrinkle in time situation again. You know, so I'm just saying, I would like to see Denis take this over. I think he'd be fantastic. But y'all let me know. Are you interested in a never ending story, um, you know, film series? Is there anything specific that you would like to see? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments down below. Um, yeah, what you got here? Never ending story by Peter Jackson or Spielberg. That would be awesome. Um, my only concern is I don't know if Spielberg would be set to do multiple movies, but either one of them, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, oh, actually, hold on. I got a couple. I had one more update. Hold on. We got another update here. Uh, we had talked about this before. Uh, Denzel Washington was going to team up with Spike Lee. Uh, both of them were going to do a, a, a remake of uh, an Asian film, um, High and Low. Um, but now we just got an update that they're adding to this list and it's looking pretty solid. Looks like Jeffrey Wright is going to be added to this list. This is Oscar nominated, excuse me, Oscar nominated uh, Jeffrey Wright joining this. And that only to me means that y'all are upgrading the quality of the film. You you cannot put Jeffrey Wright in something and have that be a downgrade. It, it just can't happen. Um, and for those of you that don't know, um, High and Low, that was uh, uh, the 1963 Japanese movie. Uh, it told of a shoe execute executive that was in the middle of a complex uh, corporate takeover when his plans are derailed by the accidental kidnapping and ransom of his chauffeur's son instead of his own son. So I haven't seen the original, um, but like I said, you got Denzel, you got Spike Lee, you got Jeffrey Wright. 
that's I was sold already with Denzel and Spike Lee. But if you're throwing Jeffrey Wright in there, I like the sound of that. So you guys let me know. Is this something that you're interested in? Does it sound like something you'll be checking out? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, <clears throat> uh let's see diddy or what you got i heard that they're getting the guys that made the willy wonka thing in scotland the movie Ooh. oh oh mm -mm. mm -mm. i don't that that willy wonka experience no no i hope not that that would that, that, that would just be a waste now you're just wasting people's time you wasting their time don't do that i hope not uh all right let's move on um we have a new movie study that has been out, um, and, you know, they've been doing these studies for a while now. Now, of course, every study, you got to take it with a grain of salt, you know, because things change, people change. Ever since the pandemic, we've had, I would argue, a huge shift, a paradigm shift in viewing habits and the way things are being distributed in theaters versus streaming, um, you know, audiences and stuff, all that stuff has been changing one way or another. Um, but we have a new study out now, and it's saying that there's surprising data that suggests the end of movie theaters is closer than expected. Uh, it says here 66% of American adults have chosen streaming platforms like Disney Plus and Netflix over movie houses. The survey also noted a significant shift in viewing habits. 30% of respondents said that they only watch movies in theaters several times a year, but they will likely stream the same movies up to three times a week. So, you know, I've already said that, um, you know, and I, I, you know, for those of y'all that have been here for a while, y'all know ever since the pandemic was around back in 2020. I told y'all, even though this conversation kept coming up, it's the end of movie theaters. Nobody's going to go to movie theaters. It's nobody. The movie theaters are dead. I told y'all it wasn't going to go nowhere. I told y'all that because that's not the way people work. Now, was streaming going to do an uptick? Absolutely. But you were not going to just get rid of stream of theaters. Why? Because that's where the money resides. But at the same time, you still have the other issue with the theaters, which is they cost too much. And last we checked, not trying to get political, but inflation is on the rise. Well, actually, it's going down, but inflation is still a thing. And people are not getting raises to match inflation. That's been going on for decades. OK, so the fact that things are getting more expensive and the fact that people are not making more money, that is going to be a natural deterrent for people to go. I don't care about all this stuff of people want to go because uh, it's easy or whatever. Actually, they got some more excuses here. Let's go through the excuses. It says here that there's an inconvenience of going to the theaters is the primary reason for the preferences. 24% said they were just uninterested in going. 23% cited sanitation and hygiene as their concern. Audiences, uh, audience distractions, travel inconveniences, Film and seat selection, screening schedules, and inconvenient theater locations were also noted. I don't care about none of that because all those things were present before. So that can't be a legitimate reason to me because those were always issues, but yet people still turned up. And I don't, I'm sorry, I can't pull up the uh, the study that we talked about back in like 2020, 2021. But the one study that I think still resonates today is the price of going to the theater. When the study did mention, not this one, but the previous study, it said when the ticket prices went down, people were more likely to show up. I still go to the theaters and on uh, $5 Tuesdays, that sucker is packed. The theater is packed all the way through on $5 Tuesdays. So that to me, tells me that it's not an inconvenience issue. It's a pricing issue. And as a father, listen, my kids just came up to me and was like, oh, daddy, when are we going to see uh, uh, Kung Fu Panda 4? I said, when Kung Fu Panda 4 comes home, when it comes on streaming, that's when we're going to watch it. Why? Because I, the dollar sign started going through my mind. The second she said, oh, can we go see it? I was like, oh, mm, $10 for you, 
ten dollars for you, another fifteen dollars for the for the older child, another fifteen for the wife, fifteen for me. That's already a fulfilling dollars. And then all y'all gotta eat, even though I just had y'all eat dinner at home, and y'all still want to eat. The wife want to eat like she, she want to eat a whole a, a, a whole cart of popcorn and she want to get a big old thing of pop and everything. And of course, when they see her eating, they don't want to eat off her. They want to get their own popcorn and they own drinks. And I'm like, well, dang, that, that go another fulfilling. So meanwhile, I'm sitting there crying broke, looking at my wallet, trying to calculate the next, you know, bills and everything while everybody else watching the movie. No, nah, we got Disney Plus at home. Y'all can wait. Where y'all going? Y'all ain't got no business. Y'all just going to school, playing games. Y'all can wait. So the money is a huge factor. It's a huge factor. And I, I would rather deal with that. That's a bigger issue versus, oh, where are we going to sit? Uh, oh, the, the hygiene. Movie theaters have always been nasty. What are you talking about? You always have to deal with that. Sticky floors? popcorn on the floor what you mean this is normal so yeah it's always gonna be i don't care what they talking about in this study it's always gonna be the price issue for me now here's the sneaky thing and and maybe some of y'all can testify to this too and i'm guilty of it i'm guilty of it if you lower the ticket price it's a lot less daunting to pay for all the expensive food we know the food is expensive. And to be fair, the food is how the theaters make their money. But all I'm saying is like, if you tell me, hey, come on in, it's only $5. But meanwhile, you done bamboozled me with this money, with, with, with the food. I'm Psychologically, I'm a little bit more willing to spend more money. But if the ticket price up front at the door is way too much, I might not even do it. Might not even go. You might not. You lost me. So I'm just saying it's easier to get us through the door with a lower ticket price and make your money on the back end versus a high ticket price and high food prices. Nah, man, I ain't going psychologically. I'm not going. But anyway, y'all let me know. What do you think about this study? Um, do you agree? Maybe you agree. Maybe um, the hygiene is a problem. Maybe finding a seat on the app uh, is hard for you. I don't know. Whatever you think, let me know in the comments below. Uh, Nelson, what you got? Did I see the Ghostbusters movie? No. Nope. There's, there are certain things that, um, you know, you get a critic radar, a little six cents. For me, it just did not come off as something that was going to be good. And from what I've seen and from what I've heard from other people, it ain't that. Um, so I wasn't blown away by the last Ghostbusters movie. And this one looked a little suspect to me. So, no, I ain't see it. And I, I don't really plan on seeing it. Um, but if y'all want to, check it out. That cool. You know, good luck. Uh, Frigga, evening, E man, and E fam, evening, right back to you, Frigga. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Um, hold on, I got some folks. Oh man, hold on, I gotta give some love back. Um, <laughs> Samantha, thank you so so much. Uh, for the two dollar cash app says, uh, thanks for keeping my husband entertained. You're both, you both are welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna send some love right back to you. I appreciate you guys. Thank y'all both for watching. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, okay, so we have another quick update. Boondock Saints. Now, I will be very honest. I have not watched the Boondock Saints movies. Um, the, it, it's one of those movies that has always been considered a cult classic. I don't think it was like a box office thing. But it was one of those movies that was always a cult classic, and it has been on my watch list for years. Um, so it is something I definitely plan on watching. It is definitely some. I think it's two movies, right? Boondocks 1 and Boondocks uh, Saints 2. So I do plan on watching it. Y'all ain't got to get on me. My name is, you know, never mind. I, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to drag nobody. Uh, but um, uh, it seems like, you know, for a long time, there have been discussions about what 
is going to happen. Are they going to do more or not? We don't know. Well, now we do know because the Boondock Saints are back and it is going to happen. It says here a universe expansion of the film franchise uh, about the fraternal uh, twin Irish brothers who raise holy hell to raid to rid their Boston hometown of all criminals. Uh, now, the difference is Troy Duffy, who was the director of both movies and the writer, he is going to uh, step aside. So he's not going to be involved. Um, it does say here that Reedus and Flannery are going to reprise their roles um, and the search for a new director is on the way. So uh, if you are a fan of these series, uh, of this franchise, um, you know, it is coming back. You're getting another one. Um, unfortunately, I can't comment on whether this is a good thing or not. Um, but, uh, I would say that given how fun people like, given how much people like the first and second one, I would think that it might be a little concerning not to have the director come back. That, that part is kind of, a little, eh, that's a little strange to me. Um, or there might be a yellow flag. I won't say it's a red flag, but it might be a yellow flag. So I don't know. For those of y'all that have watched Boondock Saints, um, how do you feel about this? Do you like the fact that, you know, Norma Reedus is coming back? Flannery is coming back? Um, do you feel some type of way that the director is not going to be uh, directing it at all? I, I, whatever you think, let me know in the comments down below. All right. Um, Ray, what you got? Uh, I make almost six figures and I still sneak food in the movie theaters. I wish they stopped remaking movies no one asked for. I totally hear you on that. Nice flex, by the way. Nice flex. I ain't going to listen. You know, come on through, Ray. You know, listen, I don't know if you're single or not, but if you're putting out your high value status for the people out there, go ahead. Do your thing, bro. Go ahead. Uh, but thank you so much for that. Thank you um let's see uh we got some more movie updates what else we got oh okay um i think my wife would love to hear this but happy gilmore um you know the famous uh adam sandler movie i would say that this happy gilmore probably was one of adam sandler's better movies um so that uh you know that and what else water boy was probably one of mine I don't know what else. Mm, I don't know what uh, what other ones would be in like his top top ones. Because Waterboy is like one of my favorites. I know somebody said Click, but I'm like I don't know if Click was like a top five. Maybe I don't know. Either way, y'all could debate which uh, um, Adam Sandler movies y'all like. But um, Happy Gilmore to me is like one of the top three. One of the top three. Um, and we do have an update now on what's going to happen. Are we going to get a sequel? Is that not going to happen? Um, but here he is. It says here, Happy Gilmore 2 is apparently being developed by Adam Sandler and a script even exists. Shooter McGavin or Christopher McDonald. He uh, revealed this in a, a radio interview. <clears throat> he said, I saw Adam about two weeks ago and he says to me, McDonald, you're going to love this. I said, what? He says, how about that? And he shows me the first draft of Happy Gilmore 2. Maybe you should cut that out of this audio because I don't want to be a liar. But he did show me that. And I thought, well, that would be awesome. So it's in the works. Fan demand it. Dang it. So, um, yeah, you know, listen. My Here's my only thing. I think that I'm a little concerned about any comedy that is brought forward after a long hiatus. Because as we know, comedy has changed over time, right? So that's kind of my only concern is, can Adam Sandler not just recapture the magic of Happy Gilmore, but can he maybe modernize it? I mean, his last couple of movies have not been the worst. Um, I still think he's funny enough um personally i'm starting to like adam sandler more in dramatic roles i thought he was exceptional in uncut gems but i don't know is there still room for a happy gilmore 2 is are y'all one of the fans that are actually demanding it or do you think the ship has sailed whatever you think let me know in the comments below 
Uh, oh man. Okay, we got we got some uh we got some beef to talk about. Um Oh man. And then yeah, oh, I almost forgot. Then you have Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers passing. Now, I mean I'm I would assume that they would probably put a nice little tribute in there, you know, for his character, but uh, that's going to kind of suck. That's going to kind of suck. I don't know. I don't know. But y'all let me know. Y'all let me know. Um, What else do we got? Okay, we got to talk about the MJ controversy. Now, we have talked about how there is going to be a Michael Jackson biopic that's in the works. Um, Antoine Fuqua is going to direct. Um, that is the Equalizer director, Training Day director. Uh, so we got a competent director. Um, Jafar Jackson, who is Michael Jackson's nephew, looks like him. We've seen some of the pictures already. Looks like he's got the mannerisms and everything. My man can hit the dances. I think he also can sing. At least some people have told me that. So it sounds like we got a good Michael. We got a good director. Uh, we got Coleman Domingo, you know. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Oscar nominated uh, Coleman Domingo uh, to uh, come in and play um uh, uh joe jackson and this is fresh off of coming uh from playing mr and in, in uh color purple then we got nia long playing mama jackson as well listen i like everything i'm hearing about this so far but somebody somebody ain't with it somebody's already got some problems you know now this is not to say that a michael jackson uh uh you know biopic was not going to come with some level of controversy because the question is what angle are you going to take and we don't know right like we've seen different documentaries take different uh you know approaches is this going to be a all-encompassing from when he was a little kid to when he was an adult um is this going to be just maybe focusing on certain aspects of his life like we don't really know what it's going to do but somebody got beef with this and they had something to say um so let's get to it here it says here, uh, the Leaving Neverland uh, director, Dan Reed, is calling this biopic a complete whitewash. Whoa, no pun intended. Um, <clears throat> he said here that, and th I believe he did, he was able to read the script for it. He said, it's an out and out attempt to completely rewrite the allegations and dismiss them out of hand and contains complete lies you never see him alone with any boys when it is a matter of fact that he shared his bed with small children for many years okay all right so this is uh this is kind of tough because as we all know michael jackson absolutely had controversies he had a lot of things. I mean, this man has been in trial. He'd been in court and all that um, over a lot of allegations. To my knowledge, to my knowledge, I believe he was found innocent on those things. Now, of course, there's still people that believe he did inappropriate things. There's still people that believe that um, he was guilty of those things. You know, a lot of this stuff was coming up when I was younger, so I didn't like, you know, and it's not like we had the Internet to really follow everything and every detail. Um, the only thing I ever concluded was that Michael Jackson was weird. That was it. That, that Fantastic. One of the greatest performers of all time. But the man was weird. You know, he had a traumatic childhood, um, was under the lens, couldn't live a normal life. So it never surprised me that he had weird tendencies or that he was not going to always fall into certain social norms i get it but um the leaving neverland and i don't even think i i didn't see the leaving neverland um documentary or whatever but i do recall it was like heavily um based off of all of the allegations against michael jackson um and if you think about it this biopic um I believe one of the uh, executive producers is the Michael Jackson estate. So his family is behind this, you know? So like, you know, are they all lies or is it just their 
truth. You know, now I know sometimes that gets a little tricky when people are like, live your truth and it's your truth. Sometimes truths can conflict, right? Because your truth might not actually be the truth, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but I think that this is where, you know, we also have to remember the responsibility of some biopics and the responsibility is us as the viewer. The responsibility of a biopic is to give a certain perspective. Just like Leaving Neverland was like, yo, this is going to be probably a more negative look at MJ. This Michael biopic probably wants to give a more positive one. I think both can coexist. And I think that, um, you know, if uh, um, as the viewer, we just have to realize Every biopic is not going to tell the entire story with 100% accuracy. There's always going to be some level of bias in any type of documentary or, or, or a, a biopic that we see, you know? So, you know, it's like, listen to me. I'm like, look, let everybody cook. Let them all rock. Let them all do their thing. And then let audiences, because most of us were alive or we all witnessed a lot of this stuff. Let us just determine it when it comes out. You know, now, um, I think that this film, I don't think that this film is going to completely ignore the stuff um, because it was a huge part of Michael Jackson's like reputation. Yes, he was a, a, a global cultural icon, but at the same time, this was part of his story. So I don't really know how this movie could escape it. It sounds like from what he's saying that they just didn't address that specific uh, element of him being in bed with little kids or whatever. Um, I, it sounds like they'll probably talk about the allegations, but I don't think that they need to show all of those things, especially if the family and the people that are behind it probably didn't believe it. But again, I don't know. I don't have all the facts. But y'all let me know, what do you think about what the Leaving Neverland director had to say about this? Um, do you think that they need to show those type of things? Do you think it's not necessary? Do you think that maybe there's a different artistic way to imply what we already suspected or what was already alleged? I don't know. But whatever you think, let me know in the comments down below. Uh uh raymond what you got here the director of the leaving neverland documentary can't be trusted he even said that he knew that the stories uh weren't consistent had major errors and still made the doc i don't trust him see but this is what i'm talking about nobody told the leaving neverland documentary you know a, a director not to tell his side of the story you know he was free to make his movie however he wanted and guess what we, the audience, were free to sit there and be like, okay, we either accept that and believe it, or nah, that's cap. So, you know, to me, I'm like, let these things go. Let them go. So, yeah, if, if you don't trust them or whatever, that's perfectly within your right. I think that's fair. Um, but thank you so much for that. Appreciate you. Um, hmm. Boy, 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 we got a fun little theme going on. Uh, looks like we got another director. <sighs> good old legacies um so recently um <clears throat> there was a trailer that uh that released we were not able to watch it because of the whole copyright situation but the um the crow has been released and you know i watched the trailer it was i you know i already told y'all my man wasn't pale enough he wasn't white enough in his skin color. You know, I'm saying if you're going to play the crow, at least you got to be nice and pale white. You know, <sighs> they just put some makeup on him or whatever. And. Um, yeah, it was it was all right. But anyway, some people got in their feelings about it. Some people were thinking about this whole remake and uh, it's not sitting too well with them, you know, and y'all let me know. If you um, have any feelings about The Crow or not, because, you know, it, it's supposedly a beloved franchise, um, a cult classic, 
But some people are feeling some type of way about the fact that it's actually being remade. And this is coming from Alex Proyas, I think his name is, who directed the original version of The Crow in 94. And he's not a fan of the idea of remaking the film. He said here, I really don't get any joy from seeing negativity about any fellow filmmakers work. And I'm certain the cast and crew really had all good intentions as we all do on any film. So it pains me to say any more on this topic, but I think the fans response speaks volumes. The Crow is not just a movie. Brandon Lee died making it and it was finished as a testament to his lost brilliance and tragic loss. It's his legacy. That's how it should remain. Well, 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 well. So, you know, this director made this um, this post. I believe he uh, posted this on Facebook, I want to say. And when I went to go look for it, um, the post seemed to be taken down. So I think that he kind of saw maybe a little backlash of it. Um, and he quickly, you know, took this down um, right after possibly. I don't know. Or maybe he felt some type of way because it's kind of like, you already, you literally just said you don't want to talk bad about other filmmakers, but in a way, you kind of are talking about them because you're basically accusing them of ruining Brandon Lee's uh, legacy. Um, and he did say, it, it was said here that uh, his post included links to an article from Comic Book Resources about the unusual number of dislikes garnered by the first trailer for the new film. Um, he also talked about how the character had a bad hair day. Next reboot, thanks. Yeah, bro, you sound like a hater. You sound, you sound like a hater. I'm just saying it, it, it's it's kind of coming off kind of hater ish, you know. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. I agree. This haircut is whack. It is absolutely whack. But you can't sit here talking about you don't want to talk about other directors and filmmakers, and then you post two different posts basically throwing them under the bus, you know. Now, for those of you that don't know, uh, Brandon Lee was the son of Bruce Lee, famous martial artist, actor, um, and he did die during uh, the making of the Crow movie. Um, since then, um, the Crow has had sequels. It had, like, I want to say two different sequels, and they just did not do very well. Those sequels pretty much messed up. Um, but... And I think a lot of y'all already know where I'm going with this. This director believes that this remake is actually ruining Brandon Lee's legacy. But newsflash. And y'all let me know. Before any talk of The Crow was even mentioned of this remake, did y'all hear anyone talking about Brandon Lee? I, I'll, I'll pause because I want y'all to actually comment in, in, in the live chat, whether you're on replay. Do you recall ever seeing anyone talk about Brandon Lee before a Crow remake was even announced? I don't. And I don't recall a lot of people even knowing who Brandon Lee, it, you know, was, especially for a new generation. Why is that? Because there was no remakes. There were no recasts. I've already told you guys, it is a complete myth. And this director is absolutely wrong to believe that by remaking something, it will have a negative impact on the previous actor. No, it won't. Because I remember when, and this is pre-internet days, I remember when those sequels for The Crow came out and they were terrible. People were like, man, we miss Brandon Lee. Man, Brandon was so great in that other, in the, in the original movie. It does not matter if the next movie is bad. It doesn't matter if the next actor is worse than the original or previous actor. It does not matter. But let me tell you what does matter. Every time you recast, every time you remake, what happens? We remember the previous folks that did it before. Did we not just talk about the fact that there's going to be a Popeye movie live action 
Who cares whether that Popeye is going to be good or not? Guess what? Rest in peace, but we just sat here and talked about Robin Williams. His legacy will continue if they keep on making Popeye movies. Same thing will happen for Brandon Lee if The Crow ends up being successful, or even if it doesn't. But if they keep on remaking it, if they keep on trying, they're going to keep that legacy going. So, once again, recasts and remakes do not negatively impact previous actors. It only enhances their legacy and it keeps them relevant because, again, last time I checked, nobody was talking about Brandon Lee. And what have I said before? The number one way to kill a legend is to stop talking about them. That's how they stop. That's how they die. So this director, I believe, was completely wrong about Brandon Lee and this remake because his legacy kind of was fading away when nobody was talking about The Crow. No one was talking about it. No one remembered him. But now people can. Now people will look at this Crow movie and they'll be like, man, this, wait, this wasn't the first one? All right, let me go back and check out the original. Oh, man, Brandon Lee was great. Man, he was awesome. He was so great. And people will remember that. So y'all let me know. Maybe you guys agree with them. I, I don't know. Maybe you do agree. If you agree, you know, with the director about recasts and stuff, I, I don't know. If you don't, whatever. Let me know in the comments down below. <sighs> uh, 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 uh. Oh, excuse me. J. Dot, what you got? Uh, is this the same Dan Reed that won an Emmy for pedo fiction? Respectfully disagree, man. Everybody don't deserve to cook that four hours of anecdotes. Got debunked five ways from Sunday. Okay. Listen, that my thing is this though. Like I said, I I don't have a problem with you doing something and then leaving it up for being criticized you know now i don't know if it was emmy worthy again i didn't see it i didn't watch it um but the fact that it's been debunked i think is helpful if that is what happened um so yeah you know like i put your work out there let it get praised or let it get you know criticized either way that's the approach i'm taking with it you know um now if it's hateful and if it is flat out wrong from the very beginning, okay, fine. That's a different story. Um, but I don't know if people knew going in that whatever got debunked or was false or not. I think that's a I think that's a that's more hindsight talking. Um, because if we had known that you know, whatever subjects or whoever people they were talking about were not credible from the jump, then I don't even think this movie that movie would have even been made. Um, but I don't I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, it's not fair to give them a shot. Only because we just learned about it after that it was false. You know, I think it's better if we know it's false ahead of time and then not give them a shot, if that makes sense. But thank you so much, uh, Jay. I appreciate you all. Good. Uh, thank you so much. Um, all right. Ah, let's let's keep this energy. Let's. Uh, Let's keep this energy, guys. Jake Gyllenhaal has got a new movie out called Roundhouse. Um, you know, it is a remake of the previous movie from 1980s of uh, played by uh, Patrick Swayze. Um, you know, keeping his legacy alive. And, um, you know, I like the movie. Thought it was cool. Um, but during a press run, uh, Jake was asked the question, um, that, you know, I think a lot of people have been wondering because I personally think that Jake Gyllenhaal is an underrated and fantastic actor. I think that this guy, um, when you really watch his movies, he puts it on the line and he is just amazing. I mean, Nightcrawler showed me this guy's range. If you haven't seen Nightcrawler, you could watch that and be like, oh, so he can have that Heath Ledger Joker energy. Right. Like he can do that. Um, if you've seen Prisoners, he's fantastic in Prisoners. And that was just a great movie. 
Um, but Jake Gyllenhaal is a fantastic actor and he can do the physical stuff. Obviously, in Roundhouse, he can do the physical stuff. Um, and then uh Southpaw, I really thought he was great in Southpaw uh, Southpaw. The movie wasn't that great, but he was really great in it. The guy keeps himself in shape. Um, you know, we saw him in uh Spider-Man Far From Home as Mysterio. I really enjoyed his performance there, but this kind of lends the question of like, yo, you know, would you want to do something else maybe in the superhero genre? Now, it was made known in the past that he actually auditioned um and I believe he lost to Christian Bale uh for Nolan's Batman. So, you know, in a recent interview, he was asked, "Yo, would you want to play Batman?" because keep in mind, James Gunn does have a new fresh DCU coming out and he is doing a uh, Batman Brave and the Bold and listen Personally, I would love to see Jake Gyllenhaal take on uh, the role of Batman, especially one that's a little bit older. Not old like the Zack Snyder old Batman, but like one that's old enough to have a kid. Um, I think he would crush it. I've even been on record to say um, I still believe that Jake Gyllenhaal would probably have been a better Batman and Bruce Wayne than Christian Bale was. Um, again, you got to watch his filmography to really understand where I'm coming from with that. And that's not a knock against Christian uh, Bale. I think he's a fantastic actor, but I think that if I had to pick between the two, I think Jake would have given us something a little bit more iconic. Um, but that's another conversation. But the question is, yo, would he be down to do this? Because then again, there is that mysterious, you know, uh, thought out there or this idea that if you take on a previous actor's role, that will discredit them, uh, the previous actor, that will uh, um, dishonor them, that will ruin their legacy, and don't nobody want to touch other actors' roles, right? Well, Jake did comment on that specifically. Um, so he was asked about if he's still interested in playing Batman, and Gyllenhaal said, oh, man, that's a classic role. It's an honor. Speaking of playing roles that other incredible actors have played in the past, when I think about it, I'm going to play Iago in Othello with Denzel Washington. And I think about like the, the history of actors that have played that role throughout time, and I'm intimidated by that. So that's the first level. That's what I'm working on right now. But of course, it would be an honor always. Those type of things and those roles are classics. You don't say. So let me let me just get this straight. Let me get this straight. Batman been around for decades. Batman has been played at least by, I don't know, 10, 11 actors, TV, film, whatever. Batman has clearly become a legacy classical character because so many people have stepped into that role. And this guy believes not just that it would be fun, not that he'll just get a paycheck, but that it would be an honor to step into that role. Huh. Hmm. I didn't hear him say not one word about how the previous actors would just be negatively impacted in any way. I mean, did y'all hear? I didn't. Mm, let me see. I don't. I don't think I saw that. I don't think I saw any previous careers or any previous memories or legacies being negatively affected at all. It sounded like, and maybe this is a stretch. He was looking forward to joining that long line, that fraternity of actors that brought that character to life. Hmm. 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 I don't know. This is the this is wild one for me, guys. I, I I don't know. I don't know what to make of this um, because it seems to go against contrary. You know, it seems to go contrary to a lot of popular opinion that actors are afraid to step into roles that were held by previous actors. But apparently Jake must be, you know, of a different breed. Now, granted, 
we did also hear this from Margot Robbie when it came to her playing the role of uh, Harley Quinn. She was like, yo, Lady Gaga is about to play Lady, you know, uh, uh, you know, Harley Quinn. I love that. I want she was she basically said, I love the idea that someone else is going to take this role and keep that legacy going. Mm, 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 mm. Well, well, well. Anyway, um, you guys let me know. What do you think about uh, Jake Gyllenhaal stepping in and um, deciding that this is an honor for him to play this role? Um, you know, I haven't heard anything about, well, this actor was bad or this movie was bad. Sounds like it's a dope legacy to stand in for a character that's been around for almost 100 years to him. But y'all let me know. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. Um, we're going to stay on the DC bandwagon, uh, because we have a Joker two update. Um, now I've already told you guys, I have been a fan of, um, the Joker movie. Um, I have a video on my channel explaining the big joke at the very end. Um, and it absolutely made me appreciate the movie 10 times more. So I really enjoyed it. Um, however, uh unexpectedly the joker movie also made a billion dollars and no one saw that coming including the director todd phillips um and the studio warner brothers they didn't see that coming um but th listen the second that money came in they was like hold on wait a minute now uh and because that was a thing they were like well when you gonna get started on that sequel and Todd Phillips was, you know, we went through the interviews and stuff. And he was like, man, I ain't got no sequel. Like, I I didn't know. You know, this was a one and done type of thing. But once again, they probably just cut him a check and was like, we said, when is the sequel? And he said, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Is this check real? Yep, it is. Uh, I'll get right to it, boss. And that man wrote up a new sequel. It's called, uh, what is it? Folia de, um, And it is going to have. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is going to have uh, Lady Gaga. She's going to be playing Harley Quinn. Um, and, you know, we're we're going to get this. Now, we do have a little update now about what the plot is going to be a little bit. Um, at least we were known, we were told that this was going to be a musical. But now we're finding out what kind of musical this is going to be. Um, and this is according to some insiders that spoke to Variety. Uh, it says here that they tell Variety the movie leans heavily towards being mostly a jukebox musical as it integrates at least 15 reinterpretations of very well-known songs. One is said to be That's Entertainment from the 1953 musical The Bandwagon. I don't know that song. And I didn't see the 1953 music. Uh, forgive me. Maybe it's beyond my time. I don't know. Do y'all know that song? That's entertainment from the musical. Just, I mean, some of y'all smarter than me. Some of y'all know. Is that, is that like a popular song? Like I'm saying that they, they, they said like, oh, it's going to be popular songs. Very well-known songs. Like, like I, I thought y'all was going to go a little bit more modern. 53? I don't even think my parents were born at that point. Like, how well well known to who? I'm shoot. I thought y'all was gonna put some Lady Gaga songs on there, or something at least. You know, I mean, I mean, maybe we can, can we get some Beyonce a little bit. You know, this ain't Arkham. You know, just I don't know. Put a little country twang in there, or something. I don't. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Um. But yeah, I mean, listen, they just said it was popular. I, if it is, if it's something that y'all know, please let me know uh, if that's something. Oh, it says uh, it was associated with Judy Garland. I, Judy is beyond, that's that's beyond my time. That's beyond my time. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't know that song. But anyway, um, apparently, according to the plot, it says that this is going to take place in and outside of Arkham Asylum, I guess. So it is, uh, that's interesting. I cannot be honest with you. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this is all that enticing to me. Um, I've already thought that it was, um, 
uh, I guess, a, I don't want to say a red flag, but it was kind of a yellow flag that the director didn't have this already planned out. That kind of bothers me. If the money was the motivator, I'm like, is the artistic creativity going to be there? Because now this might feel like just a money grab and not in a good way. Um, but I don't know. You guys let me know. Uh, what do you think about this whole jukebox musical? Um, I'm assuming that means that they're just going to do a lot of cover songs or something. Um, I don't know. That might be hit or miss, depending. But y'all let me know. Does this make you want to see Joker 2 a little bit more? Does it make you a little more apprehensive? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments. Um, JN, uh, thank you so much. Jake uh, play Dylan Hall plays weird characters too well. Uh, but he could be a great uh, Batman. He played a good Mysterio in Spider-Man. I agree. I agree. And I think the fact that he can play those weird characters, it just shows to his range. Like, he can be charismatic. He can be uh, a little off. He can be very serious. Like, you know, this guy's got a really good resume, you know. So, like, that's actually, you know, a, a, a testament, I think, to his ability. So, um, that that would be kind of cool. That would be kind of cool um let's see uh okay we got that okay uh i saw the other ones here i will get to those uh towards the end of the uh chat i'm trying to stay focused so don't you worry about it we will get to them uh in the meantime we do have a trailer that we have to react to um i saw that this came out earlier and i got a little excited because uh, the Alien franchise has been a franchise I've enjoyed for a long time. Um, I know some people didn't like Alien Covenant. Some didn't like Prometheus. I like them. I like both of them. Um, you know, I've liked Alien 1. I've liked Aliens. Uh, the second one, not so much with Alien 3. Uh, Alien versus Predator, eh, not always the best, but whatever. I'm here for it. So all of these things, I'm just, I like them right i like the whole franchise in general so i heard that feedy alvarez is the one that's doing um alien romulus now feedy uh he also uh did don't breathe if y'all have not seen don't breathe go watch that that's with the blind guy in the basement solid film and he also did the newer version of evil dead and i like that i was like yo we're not doing all that campy humor it's just straight up horror blood violence let's go so when i heard that feedy was doing uh an alien movie i was definitely sitting here like okay let's see what you got so uh we do have that um available uh where we can see uh i think it was just a teaser that was dropped so this is not the full um video or the full trailer but you know let's just see uh so let's get ready to check this out All right, let's see. I think I got it right here. There we go. Okay. So this is the uh, teaser trailer for uh, Alien Romulus. Let's see what it's all about. Mm. Ooh, nope. You already got me. Nope. I'm not walking down that. Nope. No, 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 Ooh, not the face huggers. Oh, that's it? Hold on, that's it? Yo, that was like two seconds. Yo, I gotta watch that again. I gotta watch that again. Hold on. I gotta watch that again. Just give, wow. Okay, let, wait, wow. Hold on. 
I love this hallway scene because just this, I, like right now, I'm already thinking to myself, hell no. Hell no, I'm not walking down this. I, leave me in my cubicle somewhere else. No, no. Run. Oh my god. <sighs> okay. Okay. Now hold on. Hold on. It's a couple first of all. First of all. This this trailer is fire. This teaser is fire. The voice over, the sound fire. Um that yikes. Yikes! When the hell were them face huggers that fa they were that strong? They could do that. Yo, oh, f hold on. This, this cinematography, this is beautiful. Look at the color. Look at the darkness. Look at the shadow. This is what they call. This is cinematography, people. Okay, this is cinema. This is beautiful. Cause right now I'm in the seat where I'm like. I'm right behind her, and I'm like, good luck. Now, nah, you walk on. Good luck. I'm going to stay back here. You go on and keep walking. But nah. Ooh. 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 Hold on. Oh, that's a brother? Damn. You already know he dead. Dang. Come on, man. Why you sign up for this, man? Y'all right now, look at him, look at him. He got the... <sighs> this is in every... Look, look, oh my God. He got the dumbfounded look. My man is out here looking gobsmacked at the alien. You know he gobsmacked at the alien and he finna die. And I bet you he gonna be on some heroic stuff like, oh, whatever you do, run. I'll stand here and get eaten while while y'all run. Y'all know he not gonna make it. Why you get? Why you jump on this movie, man? Why you get on this? You know you finna die. How long? Okay, let's see. How long he got? Twenty minutes. I'm thinking if the movie's about an hour and a half, let's say thirty minutes. I say he got about forty five minutes and he dead. And he gonna be the first one. And I'm not trying to be Dr. Umar. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying, I bet you he going to try and save the white girl's life. I bet you money he will do that. I'm not saying this for any racial reasons. I'm just talking about a stereotypical thing that happens in movies. Don't come at me. I got 45 minutes on him. Over under. Y'all let me know. 45 minutes. He gone, though. He gone. Oh, ah! Oh, and them suckers are fast. Oh, okay. I'm good. I'm done. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I don't need to see nothing else. This, this is what I'm talking about. When you give me a solid trailer like this, you don't have to show me anything else. What else are you going to show me? All you're going to do, all they're going to do is show you further scenes that will set up the other scary moments that will take away your experience when you go to the theaters. I don't need to see nothing else. We got face huggers and a lot of them. We got people getting got. We already know the black dude finna die. We know that white girl probably gonna live. She got that Sigourney Weaver energy going on. Um, And I saw the alien. That's it. What else you gotta show me? What else do we need to do? I'm done. I will be there. First day, sign me up. What is y'all, man, man, that look, that was a, I like that. I like that. This makes me feel like this is going back to the basics when it comes to, um, you know, these alien movies 
It's not out there trying to be more than what it is. It's a spaceship. People are screwed and everybody finna die. That's it. I'm so it's a very easy formula, man. I like that. But now, yo, we got uh, some conversation here from the uh, director and um, some other interesting takes here um, about what uh, about Ridley Scott? Ridley Scott's the one that came up with this whole thing. Um, he did the first alien movie. He did the Prometheus and the alien covenant. Um, so he's, you know, the Godfather, he's the daddy, right? But then you got the Godfather, James Cameron, James Cameron came in with aliens. He, he took that up a notch, you know, James Cameron, boy, when he come in and do your sequels, boy, he kind of, he knocked them suckers out the park. So what do they think? And now we actually found out what it is. They actually thought about it because they weighed in. And it says here, there it is. It says here that Ridley Scott and James Cameron have already proclaimed their love for Romulus. Wow, they already said they love this. Now, uh, according to this here, it says the story focuses on a group of 20-something space colonizers <laughs> colonizers uh sorry uh the story focuses on a group of 20 something space colonizers and scavengers who have the misfortune of meeting an, a xenomorph inside a dilapidated space station uh let's see we go on down here in the interview um so um it says here alien romulus takes place between alien and aliens but it's reportedly unconnected to those films is that correct and the director said no that's not correct but it does take place between the two movies uh if you haven't seen any of the previous movies the director said i'm jealous because you will have an incredible experience but if you have seen the others then it's a completely different experience in a way because you'll see and you'll find those connections with the other movies and if you're a fan you'll you'll be that person who annoys your friends in the theater by telling them that you know what this is from and where that gun is from and what the characters are talking about oh i like that i like that i think that's it yep that's all um yeah i like i like that i like that um listen i think we're in for a great ride here um and who who are the actresses kaylee spaney and Is isabella mercy listen kaylee been she been working what else she in hold on now because kaylee been in a bunch of different things uh she she the one with the with the ripley energy i believe um what else was she in that uh we seen her in because i know she was in pacific rim oh she's about to be in uh civil war coming up um priscilla yeah she was in priscilla uh she was in the bad times at el royale listen listen this this i was about to call her a little girl she's 25 years old <laughs> she looked young though uh what, what here she is right here hey she is working she is working good for her good for her um listen i'm i'm ready for this and if if the original guys come in and both kind of give their okay on it that's fine by me you you i'm here for it so uh y'all let me know what do you think about the alien romulus trailer um are you feeling it are you not feeling it are you a scary pants and maybe you just don't even want to watch it at all whatever you think let me know your thoughts in the comments below um ba, 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 ba. <laughs> jn this ain't awesome hey man we need the full song i can't sing i can't sing i can't help you with that i i cannot help you with that uh but thank you so much man i appreciate you um let's see jn e-man the whole tip shout out to dr umar i got 20 minutes on the brother man listen i i'm i'm far from that far far from that um yeah that ain't that ain't my ride no 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 uh but thank you so much uh all right let's see we got another trailer we got another trailer to go through now i know this one came out a little earlier um i heard some i i kept seeing people talk about it now i will say that the acolyte is a, a project of star wars that i've been looking forward to for a while the moment it was announced um i was absolutely down for the concept 
Um, but of course, with Star Wars, you know, nothing matters until you actually see a trailer and you see that it's actually going to happen. Um, so we did get a trailer. Um, I, I, I heard some people liking it. I saw some folks digging it, but I also saw some folks hating on it. You know, I saw that um, it was getting like all these dislikes and stuff on on YouTube, I guess. So I'm like, OK. Let me see what, what it's at. I, this is something I've been really anticipating. I've really been looking forward to it, um, you know, because I, I think it has to do with like the beginning of the Sith or something like that. I don't know, but I wanted to see what this was all about. So let's check out the Acolyte trailer. All right, let's get this up here. All right. And I want to say this is a prequel or whatever. Um, so let's kind of go through and see what they got. Close your eyes. Your eyes can deceive you. We must not trust them. Tell me what comes into your mind. Life. Balance. I see fire. Oh, Trinity back? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Someone is killing Jedi. It doesn't make sense. I killed one. What happened? I sensed darkness. Yo. This isn't about good or bad. This is about power and who is allowed to use it. What is that? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'm I'm ready. Yes. Yes. I'm here for this. I'm here for this. Um let's kind of go through this one more time. Let's go through let's listen. Listen. I like this. I like this. Let's go through it one more time. Close your eyes. Getting old school Jedi. Old school Jedi. I like that. Your eyes. And that in that brother from uh Squid Games too, I think. We must not trust them. Tell me what comes into your mind. Hold on, wait a minute. Now I got questions. Where the hell all these black Jedi kids come from? Where where were they at? Because all I seen was Mace Windu. I know we had I'm my best, you know, Keller and Beck or whatever. What is that him? Like, what are we doing? I'm just saying, where all the where did all the DEI go from? You know, what, what happened to all the DEI in Star Wars? What happened? Look at all these kids. I ain't seen all these kids. Life. Balance. I see fire. Another one? Wait a minute. Hold on. We got a little black girl that's also. Yo, where does she? Where is she? Where is she? Where is he? Where is she? Where are these kids at? How long ago did this happen? This some BS. This some BS. I don't like it. 
Someone is killing Jedi. It doesn't make sense. Look at Diet Killmonger. Bro, where you come from? Where did, bro, where did Diet Killmonger come from? Come, come on now. Come on now. I'm here for it, though. I'm here for it. Shout out. What happened? I sensed the darkness. Come on. Listen. 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 This has been the one thing I have no idea why Star Wars has been missing all these years. Why the hell have we not gotten ninjas and lightsabers? This is the easy... Come, let, put, put this on. Why have we not gotten ninjas and lightsabers in Star Wars all these years? That is literally the easiest thing. See, Star, Star Wars clearly has been colonized because all we've been getting is just all this fancy little sword work and stuff. You mean to tell me that ninjas and martial arts ain't going to make this any better? This is exactly what I want to see. This is amazing. Oh, my God. You can't. Didn't I tell y'all, if you want to make anything better, just sprinkle in some ninjas. Just sprinkle some. Put, put a little sprinkle of ninja in there. That's all that's needed. I'm already sold because of that. Already. Come on now. This isn't about good or bad. See? No. This isn't about good or bad. I like that. This is about power. I like that. It's not about good or bad. It's about power. I like that. Because that, that to me, just right there, lets me know that this is not going to be clear cut. It's going to be some, you know, stuff that we're going to have to figure out. I like that. And look at Amanda. Listen. She's doing the work. I like her already. Let's go. Who is allowed to use it? What is that? And they ain't never seen no red lightsaber. I need to see this. I need to see that kyber crystal or whatever. I need to see it bleed. And I need them to be like, yo, what is that? How you get that? What kind of lightsaber is that? Like, I need to see all of these things happen. Look at it. All of them. Turn up. When was the last time you seen all these lightsabers turn up? Last time had to have been during Clone Wars, if that. Ooh, and they got blown away by some red smoke. Who got that kind of power? Listen. Listen. I'm set. I'm ready. Let's go. That right there, and it's going to be a series, that's all I need to see. Now, I'm going to just say this, because I've seen, I've seen some people... Online, I'm not going to name no names. I've seen some people say, eh, I don't know what this trailer's all about. Eh, all I saw was lightsabers in the force. That's what Star Wars was always about. I'm not here for all this little pretentious Star Wars gatekeeping. Listen, if you like, you know, Andor, go watch Andor again. Ain't nobody stopping you. Some people, it did not appeal to. For some people, we like lightsabers. We like the force. We like good versus evil. We like that. You know why? Because it's only been around for 40 something plus years. And guess what? It has not proven to be a bad thing. So it's not bad. And it's not a problem if a franchise decides to tap back into what literally made the whole thing popular to begin with. So at the end of the day, if you're going to water this down and only give me a uh, uh, freaking lightsabers and f first of all, shut up. Whoever thought that shut up. I want lightsabers. I want the force. And you're going to give me ninjas. If you want my money, just say so, because it's coming. You can have the account number. This is all I've ever wanted. Now, I also want a, a couple more, you know, 
a little bit more diversity. Listen, I, I still need to know what the hell happened to the DEI and Star Wars. What happened? Because I'm still wondering, how did y'all have DEI programs back then? You got all these little black kids and everything running around. You got all this diversity. And then now, as we see Star Wars today, I mean, I see a bunch of aliens. I see a bunch of other white, you know, Jedi walking around. All I saw was Mace Windu and Keller and Beck. What happened to them other Jedi? Where were they? Star Wars, I need to know. Anyway, we have uh, we have something from the showrunner of uh, Star Wars, the Acolyte. And I thought that this was actually pretty interesting stuff. Um, and she was just talking about, you know, some of the behind the scenes of the um, of the actual series and what went on uh, in it. And we get a couple more, uh, a little bit more information about the show, too. Um, so she says here, this is from uh, Headland, I believe her name is. She says, uh, we were obviously influenced by samurai films and Wuxa films, um, but also films like Rashomon, where you would where you see one story and then you see it done a different way. So what separates the Acolyte from some of the other Star Wars series is that it's told in that particular way. Okay, so I like that. So it sounds like we're getting different perspectives, right? So it sounds like maybe we'll be getting the Jedi perspective, you know, one episode, and then maybe the next episode, we see the same events, but from a different lens. Maybe from the Sith, maybe from the other side, don't know. But I think I like that. I like that. I like it when we get um, that that bit of a change of perspective because it forces you to really, you know, think about these things. You know, like, oh, was this person a good person? Oh, maybe they weren't so good. Were they bad? Maybe they weren't so bad. You know, so I do like the fact that we're getting that uh, bit of variety there. Uh, it says here, you definitely get the point of view of the Jedi, especially in terms of Amanda's character and trying to stop her and hunt her down. Um, but you also get enough of Amanda's character's perspective that you can also see how both of them exist simultaneously. Now, uh, at least from what it looked like, it looks like she's the one that's on the hunt and um, uh, killing other Jedi. So that's kind of like, yo, what what could make her what see I'm, I'm assuming she was a former jedi what would make her want to go on a rampage and start killing other jedi and it also sounds like this is something that's never happened before so um you know again it's got to be some sort of crazy motivation um that would make this happen now this was the pitch um that they gave and i think this is interesting it says here um when she met with lucas film she said my elevator pitch was Frozen meets Kill Bill. Whoa. Now, I get the I get the Kill Bill approach, right? Like, it looks like Amanda's character is, you know, the bride in this case, and she's just going through trying to kill all the people. I get that. I'm trying to see if, like, what the Frozen aspect is, though. You know, like, is she the missing princess of some sort or something? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, is there something she's got to let go? I, 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 listen, they also said that this was like a mystery thriller. So frozen meets kill bill. I mean, you had me at kill bill. You had me at lightsabers. You had me at, at, uh, 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 uh ninjas and the force. I'm with it. I'm with it. What else did they say here? Uh, the interviewer said the Acolyte takes place towards the end of the High Republic and a hundred years before Phantom Menace. Um, what is Amanda's character? What is she an Acolyte of? Is it the Sith? Is it the Jedi? Or is it open to interpretation? And the showrunner said it's open to interpretation at this time, but you will discover it when you're watching the show. One thing to know uh, about the show is that we've been taking uh talking about it as a mystery thriller so we still don't really know what is she an acolyte of i personally think that it, it she's just clearly a dark side user um you know like that would be the worst kept secret that this show could have but 
it is interesting that they're at least going to try to make this a mystery and a thriller at the same time. So I definitely want to see um, how they're going to make that work. Um, now, the question was like, okay, so whose point of view are we going to see? It says here, the way I see Star Wars, the dynamics are either underdog versus institution or institutional threat. Or it's father, son, sibling, sibling, master, apprentice, father, daughter. It's a familial dispute. So I would say that our show is more on the latter. People are good guys. Uh, people who are good guys can be bad guys, and people who are bad guys can be good guys. There's a lot of moral ambiguity, which is why Jody's characters, uh, Jody Turner Smith's character's line in the trailer is so important. And she said, "This isn't about good or bad." It's about power and who is allowed to use it. I like that. I like that because right there, that means that they're definitely going to um, challenge the beliefs of the Jedi because I believe at this time, the Jedi are kind of like they've been in control for a long time. Now, here's the thing. And I think it was uh, Freddie Prince Jr. who kind of talked about this. And he was talking about like how George Lucas, Dave Filoni, how they were basically talking about how the force works. The force is always about balance because it's always about balance. That means you can't always have too much of a good thing or too much of a bad thing. So if you have hundreds of years of the Jedi being on the light side, on the good side, well, guess what's going to happen? Order 66, the Empire, you're going to need a balance to that. And that's where the Sith come in, right? And you're going to need, because you got to balance out the force. So it makes sense that if we're at the peak of the High Republic, it's time to shift that over. It, it only has to, right? Um, so clearly, I think she's going to, you know, lean on to the dark side, of course. Um, now, she did mention for some of y'all's, you know, deep Star Wars fans, uh, there's also a lot of stuff from the uh, extended universe that I got to utilize and nobody stopped me. So I did. So if you happen to be one of those people that read all of the, um, you know, comics and all the other extended stuff, it looks like she's bringing those things to life. I have not read all those things. I haven't watched all of them, mainly because I thought that it was stupid. Um, not to say that the content was stupid. I just thought that it was stupid on Star Wars to give us very vital good information about characters and different stories and make people go out to go read those things rather than making movies making tvs because i believe that when you give people reading stuff that should be supplemental information it shouldn't be the major stuff because you limit your audience and you limit your money making potential so unless you are like a hardcore star wars nerd you know, most people are not going to know all the other cool adventures that Darth Vader had in between the movies or the adventures that Luke Skywalker had in between because they buried them in novels and stuff. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, but there was one more thing. Um, this was about the writing creative team that was brought together. Now, here's I think is a very important thing. Um, so they were asked about, you know, uh, uh, people in the writings room, in the writer's room, the showrunner said, yeah, I just thought it would be good to have the perspective of a person that had literally never seen star Wars until she was in the room. And she said to me, why do you want me in this room? I've never even seen star Wars. And I was like, first of all, you're an incredible writer. And that's why I want you here. I want you to be questioning the narrative. I don't want myself, who's a lifelong fan, to just be relying on particular references in order to create emotional beats. I want those emotional beats to be earned and checked by someone that isn't super familiar with it. Balance. I love it. I love it. Um, I love the fact that the showrunner had that level of sense to be like, listen, I don't want this to just be a Star Wars nerd love fest. I want it to also make sense for people that maybe didn't know anything about Star Wars. Now, 
later on in the article, that writer that she was talking about was like, what? Luke and Leia are sisters and brother. Like, she didn't know anything. But the fact that it makes sense to have that one person. Now, I'm not saying it needs to be, you know, uh, uh, all people that don't know the source material or just, you know, a couple people. Like, I like the idea that, yes, maybe the majority of people should be in the room that know the content because Star Wars is a pretty familiar and well-loved franchise. But to have at least one or two people in the room to kind of be like, mm, hey, excuse me, non-nerd here. What's that? Why is that character doing that? Did you know that this doesn't make sense? Uh, help me understand this because there are certain things when you in a certain fandom that you take for granted. So having that fresh outside perspective is a great thing because if anything, not only could it help bring in newer audiences, but it could also maybe uh, um, reveal certain things to the fan base that maybe we took for granted, that maybe we were blindsided by. So I love the fact that they're doing this with this franchise. I wish other franchises would do this too. Um, but that's another conversation. But I like this. I like this. I love the trailer. Um, I am very excited for the Acolyte. I think that this is going to be solid. Um, we will definitely be covering this 100 percent um but y'all let me know what did you think about the trailer and what did you think about the description of the show being a murder mystery a, a murder thriller i'm sorry mystery thriller um what do you think about you know the fact that we get lightsabers and force and all this other stuff what you think about the lack of a dei program in star wars whatever you think let me know your thoughts in the comments down below uh Stephanie, thank you. So come on through my squad. I missed you in the E-Fam. Hope all is well uh, and uh, with you and the family. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's always great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Um, let's see. Rhonda, the homie, what you got? Listen, saw the premiere in Hollywood as a kid. It was amazing. Fell in love with the lightsaber. I'm so glad to see something else. I'm with you on that. Well, I wasn't around for the premiere, but... Um, I'm with you on that uh, level of sentiment. You know, I'm I'm here for it as well. Um, you know, and I was talking to somebody about this earlier where I was saying that, like, you know, I get it. I understand how, you know, people will like things like Andor, right? And no, I have not finished Andor. I'm sure it is solid according to people, but I think it's kind of a testament of how, like, mm, yeah, this it's not appealing to me. Um, I was brought into star wars when it talked about the force jedi dark side lightsabers this is what brought me in this is what's kept me in um and what i have appreciated about it is the fact that like not to say that we shouldn't do other stuff because rogue one was really good but even in rogue one they still had to sprinkle a little bit of lightsabers and dark side in there they still threw that, the coldest Darth Vader scene you'd ever seen. They still sprinkle that in there because they know what the people want. They know what's pro you know provocative, okay? So I'm totally with the idea of like trying new things, but I'm not terribly okay with escaping what made you exceptional and what made you, you know, where you are also. You still got to remember your roots. And my only argument is that I still think that Star Wars has a lot that they can still mine and explore that we have not seen yet. So, for example, in the Clone Wars, we got to see different ways of the Force. The introduction of the Night Sisters, for example, these are people that are not really dark side, but they're not really Jedi light side. Like they use the Force in a different way. I'm like, yo. That's interesting. When we get to see the father and the daughter and the son and all, I was like, yo, that's interesting. Like all these other aspects of the force, all these other alien races that use the force in a different way. That's interesting. You can still take these basic core elements and still elevate them in a new way and make people intrigued. So I'm like, yo, that's fine because I'll be honest with y'all. I know that well, we talked about this last week. Uh, Patty Jenkins was doing uh she doing a script for Rogue Squadron, which was going to be a whole bunch of um, 
uh some about the fighter pilots i don't care i'm i'm not saying it's gonna be bad i'm just saying that does not appeal to me that that does not appeal to me at all i like i mean y'all could throw poe dameron in there i guess okay the whole franchise had made me never care about these pilots because every time them pilots be flying around and i'll be honest it's, it's almost like star trek in the red shirts you know like would y'all for y'all trekkies out there would you want a star trek movie with that's just red shirts i don't know i mean i'm not a star trek fan like this so i i I can't say that I would want a red shirt movie, but when it comes to them pilots, I'm like, listen, if you die, you die. Should have had the force. Like I, every time I see somebody with the force, they don't be dying like that. You should have had the force. So I, I, I can't care about people in Star Wars that are not intricately tied to lightsabers, force. Listen, this is why we're here, right? Anyway, um, so anyway, I like this whole acolyte thing. Thank you so much, Rhonda. I appreciate you. Um, let's move on. Dang, we still going to be on this bandwagon? I think so. I should have put this earlier. This would have been a great segue, too. Well, well, well. Is it possible that we have a new James Bond? Now, for many, many years, James Bond, the character, has thrived and flourished throughout the years because you know we've had remakes and we've had recasts and we've had a long line of actors playing the role of james bond but rumors have been circulating about who the new james bond could be and um what they would want and um you know the broccoli family or whatever who's in charge of this uh the rumors have already been out there saying that they want someone younger uh, they want someone that can be with the franchise for like the next 10 years, um, you know, make multiple movies. And they want someone who can, um, you know, who's kind of an unknown, but not really a whole unknown either. Um, and I will say that this was not on my bingo card per se, but I'm not too mad about this pick either, because right now it's looking like uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Y'all might remember him as Quicksilver and, uh, you know, Age of Ultron. You might remember him uh, from Kick-Ass, um, you know, but this guy, he's going to play Craven in the upcoming Craven movie, um, but he is rumored to be our next James Bond. Uh, this is according to a British tabloid, The Sun. It says here, Bond is Aaron's job should he wish to accept it. The formal offer is on the table and they are waiting to hear back uh goes on to say here aaron is going to sign his contract in the coming days and they can start preparing for the big announcement so we will find out if he actually is going to be um the next james bond hope oh, maybe soon you know uh for all we know um but i'll say this i'm i'm okay with this i'm i'm very okay if they wanted to make him uh the next james bond um, I've seen Aaron Taylor Johnson like throughout the years and the guy's actually a really good actor. You know, um, I would say that, uh, if you've seen him in nocturnal animals, um, the movie's not all that great, but whatever. Um, you know, I, it's fine. The movie's fine. But like, I thought his performance in that film, what's crazy is I didn't even know he was in the movie. Like it took me a minute to realize like, wait, that's Aaron? That's him in the role? And then, of course, uh, Bullet Train, which is a fun movie. You could definitely check that out uh, with Brad Pitt. Aaron is solid in that, too. So to me, when I see an actor that can have that level of range where he can disappear in a role and he's clearly got the physicality. And this guy is, um, I would say, a pretty um, he's in shape. You know what I'm saying? Like he's a he can handle his physical roles and stuff. Um, you know, if they did pick him, let's go, let's go. Now, one thing to be uh, cautious about is that I've only seen this being reported by a couple British tabloids. Now, I have not seen. I've seen uh, people, you know, people quoted them or whatever. Usually. 
usually when something like this is happening, we would also hear from, uh, you know, Hollywood Reporter, Variety and stuff like that. Um, but we're not seeing that. Um, I see people asking, is he British? Yes, I believe he is British. So you got that out there. But um, oh, hold on. We got some. OK, we got we got people in the comments from across the pond. My man says here, hold on, let me because I listen, I trust the people over there more than anything. What did my man say? Uh, the sun is absolute hole oh, over there. Can't be trusted on any side of breaking news. Okay. Okay. I'll take your word for it. I don't know. You know, I don't know. Um, but I would take this with a grain of salt either way. Um, because you know, I think it would be a good pick if it were true. Um, I saw that he was interviewed in like another interview and they tried to ask him about the James Bond thing and he was still face about it. He was just like, hmm, next question, you know, so that usually is a sign that they might actually be in the talks. They might be in talks. Um, but yeah, take this with a huge grain of salt. Again, I haven't seen any other bigger outlets using their resources to verify it. But at the same time, maybe he does fit the profile. He is younger. I think he's in his 30s, which means that if you go with 10 years with him, hey, he'll end off as in his 40s or whatever. Uh, he's not going to be like 50 something years old like Daniel Craig. Um, and, you know, he's British. He's not a household name. You know, like I, I don't think the average person, if you walk up to them and say, do you know who Aaron Taylor Johnson is, that they'll know exactly who you're talking about. You know, household names are like Michael B. Jordan. Like, that's a household name now. Um, you know, Denzel, uh, Tom Cruise. Like, these are household names. You know, uh, I think Aaron Taylor is one of those people that people will be like, oh, I've seen him somewhere, and they might struggle with his name, but he's familiar enough. Um, now, I think the only other caveat here is, brother, if I were you, and let me just give this message right now to Aaron Taylor Johnson. If you are in contention or if the offer is on your table to play James Bond, sign right now. Because Craven the Hunter is still due to come out later this year. And we've already seen what has happened with Sony Marvel movies. I don't want you to fumble the bag. In, in America, that means to... uh drop the t i don't know i'm sorry i don't know the exact translation for across the pond what a drop the tea bag i, I don't know maybe if that translates well but you don't want to fumble the bag and let craven come out and ruin your james bond money sign on the dotted line right now because when craven come out that offer might not be there so i'm just saying go ahead bro sign on the dotted line ah Spill the crumpets. <laughs> I like that one too. That's even better. Uh, but y'all let me know. What do you think? Do you want to see uh uh Aaron, you know, Taylor Johnson? Do you want to see him play James Bond? Is this is this it? Is he the guy? I don't know. Whatever you think, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Um, all right. Uh yeah, listen, y'all come up with the stamp. Where's stamina at? Stamina, you got any other like what's what's the equivalent, brother? You know, I, I don't know what the equivalent is across the pond for fumbling the bag. What do you what do y'all say over there? Let me know. I, I you know, bro, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you ain't got no <laughs> bro, you ain't you gotta you are ambassador. You are our ambassador. I don't know if anybody else is from London out there from the you know from the United Kingdom or whatever. If you got some other phrases over there, let me know. Let me know. Um all right, what else do we have? Um uh, hold on. Let's grab these. Uh, <laughs> Team Black. Top Gun in space? Absolutely. Sure. Sure. Why not? Let's do it. Um, they better still have the force, though. That's all. They better still have the force. Um, all right. So we have. Oh, did I not put this up? Oh, hold on. Let me make this for you. Um. Um, okay, let me put this because I didn't have this created. So, um, we have talked about this before. Uh, Michael B. Jordan 
and um Ryan Coogler. Uh, they are coming together. They are making yet another movie. <laughs> Stop me if you haven't heard that before. Um, but uh, the duo is coming together. We talked about how they had this very super secret movie together. Um, and we've heard a bunch of different things, right? Little pieces and stuff, right? So one, we were hearing that, um, you know, it was a period piece. Then we heard that it's going to take place in the 1930s uh, during the Jim Crow era. And then we heard that uh, it was going to, ha- you know, have vampires potentially involved some way, shape or form. Maybe, uh, you know, Michael B. Jordan is going to play a vampire hunter. I was thinking I know some people were thinking Blade. I was thinking maybe Van Helsing ish, maybe. Um, and then we got even more rumors um, that we were going to get a double dose of Michael B. Jordan because he might have been playing a twin. Um, so, you know, he was going to play himself twice. Um, but we have more rumors about what's going on with this to kind of give us a little bit more information. Um, for one, it says here that the film has landed um, and uh, a March 7th, 2025 release date, and we will be getting it in IMAX. So that's pretty cool. Um, that sounds like they're definitely going to have to shoot that very well. Uh, it says here that it's going to be set in the 1930s South, centering on vampires uh, with dual twin roles from Jordan. Um, and that it'll be it'll have a lot of uh, anime influences. So um, if you guys know, Michael B. Jordan really, really, really likes anime. Love the fact that he loves that, too. Um, so I'm just thinking to myself that y'all just going to have some classic scenes, you know, in this movie um, where probably, you know, how like, um, you know, uh, when the samurais have they knives or they swords or whatever, and uh, they go clashing at each other and they cross each other's path and then you just kind of zoom in you see the other guy in the background and only one person standing and the other one's like and then they just die i bet you we see something like that you know or somebody gonna get sliced in half they're gonna be like ha 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 i didn't feel it then they split you know it's gonna be some classic anime stuff that's what i get the feeling of when i hear anime influences so i think that's gonna be kind of cool um But there's another rumor here that says there's been word that the plot would center on vampires going against the KKK. Well, you know, usually we don't root for vampires. But a great man, a wise man once said, let them fight. I'm here for this. I don't care. Because one way or another, blood shall be spilled. Let the bodies hit the flow. Let the bodies hit the flow. Let the bodies hit the flow. Oh, what? KKK, vampires, Michael B. Jordan, playing a twin, Ryan Coogler, directing, If y'all wanted my money, y'all should have just said so. We, I'm here. I, to be honest, I don't need a trailer. Let me know when the tickets go on sale. I don't need a trailer for this. This is this is one of those times when just the description is good enough. And keep in mind, this was also reported to have franchise potential, which means that we could get a bunch of adventures of these twin brother, maybe, maybe they're vampires. I don't know. Maybe they vampires that's traveling the world, killing races or something. I'm sorry. Ain't nothing better than sucking the blood out of a racist to me. Fictionally, but I'm okay with this from a fictional perspective. I'm okay with this. Maybe. Maybe, and I know we're getting ahead of ourselves. Maybe they travel in the future to the 1940s. Maybe they get into the World War. Maybe they go sucking the blood out of some Nazis. I'm just saying, you got some potential here. Fellas, y'all got some potential. You go ahead and suck the blood out the KKK, and then you go get some Hitler Nazis at the same time. I think we have a franchise here. 
I think we got money. And yes, I will be booking the theater for this. Watch Party Galore. Please make this rated R2. Ooh. Anyway, y'all let me know. What do you think about all these rumors about this Ryan Coogler, Michael B. Jordan movie? I mean, this thing was so top secret, they had to get the executives to come to them to go listen to it just for the pitches. Uh, I believe WB ended up winning it, so they're going to get it. Um, coming to IMAX, vampires, twins, uh, Jim Crow South, KKK finna get waxed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, whatever you think, let me know in the comments down below. Oh, man. I, I, I am looking forward to that. That's going to be good. I think that's going to be good. Um, Blade, great segue, right? Uh, since we're talking about vampires and black folks and all that, um, we have a quick update about Blade. Now, let me just uh, kind of give people a little bit of a recap of what's been going on with Blade. And, of course, you can always go and watch my videos. I have videos on the status of Blade. We've been keeping track. Um, this is a property that has had a long history of delays and issues. Um, first, it started off with having the rumor of a boo-boo script um, where Blade was barely even the, the main character anymore for whatever stupid reason. Um, and then uh, they got rid of the writer. Um, and then the director dropped out like a month before production. So this was clearly bad. Now, keep in mind, Disney was under this mandate to hurry up and chuck out all this content. So um, uh, for Marvel. So clearly the quality control fell through the cracks and Blade was not highly prioritized at all. Because if you let that boo boo script sit there for like a year, that lets me know somebody wasn't on their job. Either way, um, when they finally when Kevin Foggy finally woke up and realized Blade was in shambles, he fired, you know, the writer. He went and got a different writer for it. Uh, he got the same guy that gave us Blue Eyed Samurai uh, and Logan. Um, we got the director that did uh, an episode, I want to say, from uh, Lovecraft Country. So that was nice. Uh, we got Mia Goth uh, to play uh, one of the villains in the movie. I believe it's going to be Lilith possibly uh, i think she's also like a half witch half vampire something like that um and what's most important here the two-time oscar award-winning actor mahershala ali is happy according to reports he is very happy with the direction uh that the the movie is in now he was reportedly not very happy before but now that they got a competent director, a great writer, they have a good cast or whatnot, sounds like everything is finally, um, you know, working. Now, the only downside here is that this means that Blade is going to get pushed a little bit further. Um, so it was supposed to come out. I want to say it should have been coming out this year. But we also had the strikes with the writers, the actors. Um, but, uh, it still has not gone into production from what I understand, which means that we probably won't get this movie until 2025 or 2026. Um, now one thing I will say is that, um, uh, oh, and Delroy Lindo, Delroy Lindo is also in there. So that's also a solid, um, so those things are fine. And then we also had the rumor that maybe we were going to get a midnight suns film, which I think. That to me, that's two blade movies. You know, it's blade and a half. I'll take it. Now, we also have uh some news here, and there's a quick update. Um, and that is one of the actors that was signed on for this is no longer on the project, and that is uh Aaron Pierre. Um, he was in the uh original uh script or project, and it looks like that is no longer the case. He says here early on there were conversations about his involvement. Uh, as the project evolved, I am no longer a part of this uh, or attached, and we still don't even know what his role was. Um, so I would just say that, you know, at this point, we didn't know what the role was. Um, you know, I thought that his inclusion was pretty cool because just his presence, like he has a very big, deme like uh, um, uh, his presence on screen. I thought that they were going to make him like a vampire or something. Um, and I was like, yo, he would make like a good villain or maybe like another asset. I don't know. But either way, I like the idea of having him share the screen with Mahershala Ali. 
um you know solid actor overall from what i've seen i haven't seen a lot but solid actor overall um and i thought he could have brought like a good presence you know um but the fact that he's not gonna be on it oh well i mean i i you know i'm sad that the brother's not gonna get the to be a part of the project but he wasn't gonna make or break this anyway so oh no we lost the supporting character and we didn't even know what the role was like i saw some people freaking out online over this i'm like what y'all tripping over like if blade is not involved that's a problem but if the second or third actor on the call sheet ain't go so to me that sounds like more screen time for blade i'm okay with this I don't like it for the brother personally as, a, you know, professionally, you know, maybe hopefully he's got some other things going, but I'm like for the story. Oh, well, more for Blade. Let's go. So anyway, um, I'm OK with the fact that he's not going to be a part of it, you know, but y'all let me know. What do you think? Um, is this a make or break thing for you? Are you still even excited for Blade? Maybe you're not. And I get it. You know, like, listen, it's been a long time. It feels like they're not putting no respect on his name. Totally understand. Um, but you know, I am trying to keep the faith. I'm trying to, I'm trying to see what happens. Like I said, if Mahershala is happy, I'm happy. So we'll see what happens, but y'all let me know. What do you think in the comments down below? All right. Um, y'all movie captain America, brave new world. Um, we got an update on there. Um, this movie has been also delayed a couple times, but the rumors that have gone on with this movie have probably been um, maybe a little bit more concerning than the Blade stuff. So let's kind of go through the rundown of what has been going on with it. Now, Anthony Mackie is the lead of this movie. Um, I have shared my concerns about his character being the solo lead for this movie. Um, now, if you wanted to give me a Falcon and Winter Soldier season two, okay. But for a movie, I don't know. I don't know if that would work. So we've heard the rumors and we've seen already Harrison Ford was going to be in this movie. A lot of the insiders have already said that he was potentially going to be Red Hulk um, because, you know, they recast Thunderbolt Ross after the passing of the previous actor. Mm. Um, but um, then we also heard that, you know, Betty Ross was coming back. Liv Tyler was coming back. Like we was all these characters from the Hulk series and the Hulk movie. I'm sorry, the Hulk uh, movie from 2008. All these characters are coming back. The leaders coming back um you know betty ross is coming back thunderbolt ross is coming back and you know mark ruffalo said he wasn't but don't nobody listen or believe mark ruffalo bro's a straight walking cap um but with that said uh it was getting kind of suspect it was getting kind of suspect that uh you had all this stuff going on and it was like man this is starting to smell like another hulk movie this don't sound like no captain america movie I've also told y'all, Captain America, I don't care if it's Sam Wilson, I don't care if it's Steve Rogers, they are not the most compelling characters, in my opinion. And that is why usually what makes them compelling is not them individually, but the situations around them are usually what's interesting. Um, you know, a, 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 a civil war. It's the conflict that's interesting, even in... Uh, Winter Soldier, which is one of the MCU's top five best movies, in my opinion. Um, even that movie, which was a Cap movie, to me, Cap was not the most interesting thing. I was more interested in what was going on with the government and Hydra and Bucky and all of that. Not actually Cap. So, you know, usually, in other words, Cap still has to do a lot of work. Um, and this movie, one of the other rumors that ended up happening was that they had to do a lot of reshoots, not just any old reshoot. It's not like they just had to go tweak up and, you know, freshen up this or, oh, man, you know what? Let's get a different angle here. Those type of reshoots are already planned. Those things 
makes sense because they happen with every movie, right? They account for that. But the reshoots, according to rumors, are bigger than that for this particular movie, for Captain America Brave uh, New World. They're saying that the reshoots were so bad that they had to bring in a consultant to rewrite, not tweak, rewrite major action sequences. Um, I don't have it here, but the rumors that were also mentioned was that when they did the test screening, the audience did not like the politics. They thought it was boring. They thought the acting was stale. They thought that um, the love interest, I guess, between Sam and whoever the woman is here was not very compelling. And they said the action scenes were lackluster. Yikes. Yikes. I mean, again, these are rumors, so we can take them with a grain of salt, but I'm not going to act like I'm going to be surprised. And here's the thing. If the politics in a Captain America movie don't move people, what are you doing? That's that is Captain America. Captain America is politics, right? So I, I don't know what it but but then again, it's like, yo, the action scenes. Y'all couldn't get the action scenes together. We also heard that the Serpent Society was cut out of the movie. Listen, all I'm saying is these red flags are starting to build up. They starting to build up and it's not looking good. Now, again, Marvel slowed down. They hired somebody else. They're retooling some things. Maybe they will fix it. Maybe. But we got another update. I, I got y'all recapped up with all the stuff. But we got another update. And that is kind of unfortunate. But it looked like Sam ain't going to get the help that he should be getting. It looks like that's not going to happen. Because it says here, Sebastian Stan is officially not returning as Bucky Barnes in Captain America Brave New World. Yikes. Yikes. In case y'all rem- y'all forgot, Bucky was added to Falcon and the Winter Soldier, in my opinion, because Falcon was not going to carry that series by himself. I've told y'all this before. He needs help. He's great when he's a supporting actor. He's great when he has a co-lead, but it kind of struggles when it's just him. And the fact that y'all just had an entire series with Bucky and with Sam and you about to let you going to take the training wheels off and he not ready to ride yet. Now, this comes from uh, Anthony Mackie himself during the interview where he says here uh, when they decided Marvel to go back to the movies, it is what it is, but I don't have my friends anymore. So it kind of dampens it a little bit. Now, he's talking about um, uh, uh, Daniel and Sebastian Stan. He's talking about Zemo and uh, Bucky, that he doesn't have them anymore and that they're not going to be there. He says, anything I can do to hang out with Daniel, a dancing Daniel Brühl, makes me very happy. Yes. Yes. The dancing Zemo was fantastic. What a time. Now, Sebastian Stan is going to be also filming, and he's currently filming Thunderbolts. So he is doing another movie. And I have less trepidation about that than I do about this. I'm worried. At first, I was really trying to give it somewhat of a chance. But now I because Bucky was like one of the best things. Listen, they even gave my man the knife. I don't have my knife on me. I don't I don't I got a knife. I ain't got no knife. I need my knife. I'm gonna have to get my knife next time. Bucky with the knife. That we we, we can't even get that. 
Sam out here in the cold by himself with a bunch of Hulk characters trying to take over his movie with reportedly lackluster action scenes and all that. Like, what? Marvel, I hope y'all know what y'all doing because I don't know. I, I, I don't know about this. I, I don't know about this one. This is very concerning. You taking this man's help away? I don't know. All right, guys, you guys let me know. Um, what do you think about the fact that Bucky is not going to be in uh, Captain America 4, Brave New World? Um, you know, I've already told you about all the reshoots and the potential test screenings and the not so great reception. I mean, maybe it's an opportunity for Marvel to clean it up and to make things better. I don't know. Whatever you think. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Um, okay, I'll say that one there. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, who is this? Who, who is this? Yeah, see, y'all lucky I even like put up with y'all. Y'all lucky I put up with this. I don't know who this is. E Hate Me is my next movie. Whoever this is. Go away. I don't know who this is. Whoever this is, go away. <laughs> Y'all play too much. Y'all play too much. Thank you so much for the contribution. I appreciate you, but go away. <laughs> um, uh, Ray, what you got? Uh, I'm a CDL driver. Thanks for keeping me away. Oh, man, that is awesome. Hey, no problem, Ray. You are doing the work. I know it. Um, That is not easy work. I don't know how you stay up. But if I can help, that's great. Um, you know, but uh, hey, man, that's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Um, all right, let's move on. We still have a couple more topics. Oh, okay. We got more Marvel stuff coming up. And then uh, at the end, we're also going to talk about um, uh, the um, X-Men 97 reaction. So stay tuned. We still got that coming up. But. We have to talk about this. Now, we did uh we we talked about this last week about how um there was all this talk about the uh X-Men 97. Um No. You know what? No. We're not going to talk about that yet. We're going to talk about that before. We're going to change it up. I keep forgetting. I I can control this. We'll do that later. We'll say that for later. So, keep that in mind. We're going to talk about the X-Men firing. We're going to talk about what's going on behind the scenes at Marvel um, because we have a couple things that are happening behind the scenes that I think would be helpful for us to kind of know and talk about. Um, so a lot of stuff has been coming out because um, Brad Winderbaum, he is basically the second in charge uh, at Marvel Studios. So Ken Foggy's president and everything. Brad Winderbaum, he's the guy that is in charge of all the streaming stuff, all the... Um, you know, anything that hits uh, Disney Plus, that's his face right there. That's him right there. Um, you know, and uh, man, I'm still hurt that I, I almost had the chance to talk to him uh, and interview him. But that whole Bo de Mayo thing messed that up. So I almost had a chance to talk to him. Um, but with the people that he did talk to, um, he dropped a lot of different things and a lot of different information. Um you know, about uh, all the things he's in charge of, which again, he's in charge of everything on Disney plus. That's the Disney plus specials, the animation, the live action stuff, whatever it is, this is his domain. Um, so uh, we have an update from him about a couple Disney plus series that we've heard about. Cause keep in mind, we did also hear that um, some things were getting canceled. We just talked about how eternals Two uh ant-man 4 and um what else was it uh captain marvel 3 were going to not happen and we were all heartbroken over it yes no eternals too so heartbroken anyway um but there were some other shows that we've been talking about 
that we had no idea about. And one of those shows, two of those shows was Ironheart and um, Wonder Man. Uh, Ironheart, as we saw, was uh, teased and we saw her in uh, Wakanda Forever. Uh, Wonder Man was going to star uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen, who I always thought should have been the next T'Challa. But I guess he signed on for this Wonder Man role instead. Um, but uh, we got an update on what's going to happen with those two shows, or at least what their status is, because we ain't heard nothing about them at all. So he goes on to say, uh, it says here, the producer did not confirm whether either show would debut on Disney+, Plus, um, but they are both set in stone for a release. Uh, regarding those shows, he says, yes, absolutely. Uh, we're editing both those shows as we speak. They're spectacular. They're amazing. And they're different. We're able to explore corners of the universe that are really exciting. Riri Williams is one of them, and I cannot wait for people to meet Simon Williams. And Simon Williams is the one who is um, going to be Wonder Man, um, again, played by uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen uh, II. So both of these series are still happening. Um, they're still coming forward. Um, you know, I'll be honest. I can't say I'm excited for either one. Um, the Riri Williams one, I've already told y'all anything that was kind of like green lit during the pandemic era. And I'm talking about from 2020 to like 2022, I'm very suspicious of, um, those are not projects that to me give a lot of confidence because they were made during the time when, um, Disney, gave that mandate and basically was like hurry up and go make stuff you know so that to me i'm not really feeling um but i don't know if they fix things or not um remember at least in the uh rumors we had for iron heart the rumor was that maybe we actually will get mephisto to show up maybe um so we'll see if that happens um but these are the only two that he's really uh confirmed to be uh still happening um he did give another um update on something uh as well um but let me see is this the one did he give us the update on No. Okay. We got another one that he talked about, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, but just to kind of give you guys uh, a little behind the scenes. Now I told y'all Disney ushered that whole mandate. And that I think is a huge reason why um, Marvel studios had that boo-boo phase four and things were just not always as quality and polished that, that we're used to. Um, and you know, Brad Winderbaum basically confirmed that he says here, in a nice way. I mean, frankly, in all honesty, there was a mandate to kind of create as much as we could for Disney Plus as quickly as we could. And then there was a shift. And all of a sudden, we have to start spreading our release dates out. So that really accounts for a lot of the delays. Now we're using that time. We're not sitting idle. So it's like it stays in the oven. You can bake certain things a little bit more. It's actually, I think, ultimately, it's only going to make things better. But most of it, just frankly, shrapnel from the business. So clearly, Brad Winderbaum is a company man. He's not going to tell it to you and drag nobody under the bus. But I think that this validates basically what we already suspected. The mandate that came from Bob Chapek, who did not know a dang on thing about how to handle things on a creative side. Keep in mind, this was the same guy that went to try and drag Scarlett Johansson because during the pandemic era, when they dropped Black Widow on streaming, they screwed her out of a lot of money and they settled on that lawsuit later. But it could have damaged a lot of talent relations. Remember, they was out here like, man, Scar Scarlett don't care about the kids. She don't care about nobody. You know, like they really were doing some bad stuff. Then they took power away from Kevin Foggy. They made Kevin Foggy report to other people, other uh, business people that had no real clue about what to do on the entertainment side of things. So, again, this is why we were getting really, really bad stuff coming from Marvel um, or just not so great because that mandate to hurry up and put stuff on Disney Plus 
Marvel never had time to sit back and actually look at these things. They never had time to reflect on these things. They didn't have time. Kevin Foggy was all over the place. The man did not have time to sit there and actually think about, hey, is this working? Is this good or not? That's not to say that Kevin Foggy and everything he looks at is going to be great. But if you're taking the one person that usually has ushered in at least 10 years of solid stuff prior to that and you're running him thin, it's not a good look for the overall product. So at least we have confirmation right now that, um, as he said, a shift happened. So what is that shift? The shift is they fired Bob Chapek. Bob Iger came back. He got rid of those business people that were interfering with Foggy, and they allowed Marvel to cook the way that they used to cook. I think more importantly, they issued the other mandate of slow the hell down. Stop all that. We don't need all them sequels for everything. Eternals 2, Ant-Man 4, Captain Marvel 3. We don't need it. We don't need it. It's okay. Ain't nobody checking for those. And if they are, it's not enough. We don't believe you. You need more people. So they're going back to the basics of doing things the way that they used to, where it's like, yo, when we have a project, let's take our time. Let's make sure that we're using our heavy hitters and let's go ahead and put those things out there. Let's take some time, see if it worked, see what didn't work, and then adjust. I like that. I like that. Um, now, again, that doesn't mean that they're going to hit a home run every time, but it does mean that they're going to be at least a little bit more thoughtful with um, how they approach the content that they give us. And I'm okay with that. I want them to take their time. Um, so we have a little bit more from Brad. Uh, in these interviews. So there were a couple of things that I thought you guys might find interesting. So I'm not obviously going to read the whole interview, but I'm going to read a couple snippets of it. Um, and this was, this is going back to uh, X-Men 97. Um, and this, he's talking about basically like how it came about. So we'll talk about a little bit of that. And then, um, you know, I'll give my thoughts on it. Uh, they asked him like, yo, you know, how did X-Men 97 come to be? What was the process? And he said, look, it was right after What If. Uh, we had just finished the first season and everyone was really happy with it and it did really well. Based on the response to that show, Kevin Feige was like, well, what else do you want to do? And the first thing Brad Winderbaum said was, I want to revive X-Men, the animated series. And Feige asked the most important question. Can we get the music? Do we have the music? And then it was off to the races collecting the most creative, talented X-Men fans to bring this to light. Listen, I know that there are a lot of things that we can easily criticize Marvel for, and I'm here for the criticisms, but I have to tell y'all, I'm also here to give them credit when it is due, and I think this is when it's due. They said specifically that after the reception of the first season of What If, that's when Kevin Feige said, what else do y'all want to do? And Brad said, X-Men. What If came out, what, a couple years ago? It's vitally important, and this is what I keep telling y'all. Your voice matters. Your dollars matter. When you guys see things that are mediocre to not good, you have to let the studios know. Because if they just sit there and be like, well, everybody watched. Well, everybody paid their ticket, so they must like it. No, you have to let them know directly whether you like certain things or whether you don't like certain things. So, for example, I'm telling you right now, X-Men 97 has been getting nothing but positive praise all over social media, all over the articles that are being written about it all over the videos that are talking about it. You don't think Marvel has heard that? You don't think Marvel's like, hey, I think we got a winner with this X-Men 97. Let's do some more. They hear that. When they heard that y'all loved the first season of What If, they said, all right, bet. Let's do some more. You know what they didn't hear? They clearly didn't hear y'all talking loud enough about, I don't know, uh, 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 Ant-Man. Or whatever, because they really thought Ant Man was gonna be a banger. They need to hear the times that y'all are not happy, so that they give time to adjust. 
And listen, the, my God, I love the fact, this is why Kevin Feige is the president. My man asked the most important question. If anybody says, let's bring back the X-Men animated show, if your first question is not, can we get the music, get out of my face. You don't belong here. Because the animated theme music, that is absolutely 100% crucial. The only other property, I would say, that needs that same energy and needs the same questions asked would have to be Mortal Kombat. If it's not Mortal Kombat's theme music, that's the first thing that you're thinking about, step away from the property. I don't want no remixes. I don't want no cover songs. I want the same 80s techno beat. Put that back on now. Same thing for X-Men. Now, don't get me wrong. The series has kind of tweaked the theme music just a little bit, just a little bit, but it's good enough. I'll, I'm fine with what we got right now, and it works. But I like the other point that he made here. The second he got the green light to go ahead and do the X-Men series, what did he say? It was off to the races, getting the most creative, talented X-Men fans to bring this to light. What have so many of you guys been talking about? What have so many people been having issues about when it comes to the Marvel properties? When they stray away from the source material or when they get too many people that don't know the source material. And what have I told you? I've told y'all it's one thing to get people that know the source material. What Marvel was trying to get away with was getting people that did not know the source material and then they had to hurry up and do a cram session and read everything in like the next three months. And I'm like, that's still a problem because if you give people that late night study cram session to try and catch up and then give us a product, real fans, people that are familiar with the stuff are going to be able to see through that. Why? Because reading the stuff last minute does not mean that you really understood what gravitated with people. It will mean that you don't really know what resonated with the audience. Perfect example, whoever the hell is in charge of, of Venom over there at Sony, y'all don't know a damn thing about him at all. Because if you knew anything about Venom, I guarantee you would not have sat here and said, let's make it a buddy cop type of situation or an odd couple pairing. That was one of the dumbest decisions. I don't care if y'all made money the first time around. I don't think that it was indicative of your decision making. Everybody knows Venom got popular in the comics and the source material because he was a menace, because he was a straight problem for Peter Parker. That is the secret sauce that made Venom great. Yes, eventually you can make him nice and anti-hero, but if you don't understand that his presence of being a top tier villain was the real issue, you don't know what you're talking about. So anyway, I love the fact that Marvel went back to the basics and was like, you know what we should do? We should actually go get X-Men fans. And you know what they did? And they said this in the interview, too. They went back and talked to the original creators. They went back to the people that originally made the X-Men animated series, and they brought a lot of them back. They brought the voice actors back. They brought the directors back. They uh, asked them questions. It was like, yo, what did you do? What, how did you make this work? You know, help us out. Th they did all of that work, and I think we're starting to see the proof in the pudding. We are going to talk about that later on, but we are seeing that when a real when the creators get back to the basics of the source material and they get people that know what they're talking about, you actually get a good product. Crazy concept, right? So um, it was also asked of them, um, uh, the question here, did any live action projects that have come out since the original uh, X-Men series influence this reboot? Um, and Brad had said, when we do a live action of any of these X-Men characters, we're always thinking about where they were in the source material in the comics and what people love about them. Brad, you my boy. You my boy, Brad. Now, I met Brad. Okay, I met Brad once at the Critics' Choice. Cool guy. Brad, that's Cap. I'm going to have to call you out on that, sir. That is straight up Cap. Okay? Now, I don't know if you're talking about maybe... In the future, you guys will take characters, put them in live action, and do a, maybe in the future. But y'all sure enough did not do that recently. 
Let me bring y'all back. Thor 4. Gore the God Butcher. Where was the source material with that? My man barely butchered any gods. So what were y'all looking at with that? Help me out. Now, I like the sentiment. This is what y'all should be doing. But y'all been dropping the ball on certain things. Now, hopefully you fix that moving forward. But nah, man. Y'all, y'all messed that up. Gore the God Butcher, y'all messed that up. What nothing source material about him outside of his name. That was it. Um, little fun thing here, uh, for anybody thinking about crossovers. They said here in the original series, uh, there were crossovers with Spider-Man and even some surprise cameos. Do you envision that in this version? He says here, without going into spoiler territory, the original show does have a lot of fun cameos, and the 97 uh series carries that torch that is facts um if you did go back and watch the old uh animated series the x-men series the, everybody showed up but they threw everybody in there for no real reason like dr strange showed up punisher showed up t'challa black panther showed up they showed them for like two seconds but they all show up spider-man shows up well i'm sorry no the x-men show up in the spider-man show so they do they were doing the the connected universe back then a long time ago um so it is definitely possible that this could uh continue and it would make sense we'll talk about that in uh the review of the uh episodes as well um now he also talks about some other marvel projects here um so and he gives some insight on that uh they said yo speaking of like eyes of wakanda or your friendly neighborhood spider-man uh, what's your overall vision for Marvel animation? Uh, he says, Eyes of Wakanda. Um, it fits right into our sacred MCU timeline of continuity. Ryan Coogler is going to be the producer on it. He says here, it's about Wakandan history and mythology, and it's really cool. It looks amazing, and it feels like, okay, I'm getting an animated look into the MCU. All right, we'll see. I mean, I already told y'all. Um, I can't say that it's like one of my higher anticipated type of things. Um, I'm not a fan of uh, jumping from character to character. And, you know, now it depends on how they handle it. But um, I believe they said that one of the rumors was that it was going to be uh, visiting different warriors of Wakanda or whatever. I, man. OK, we'll see. We'll see. Um I know one thing though. You could bring T'Challa into the X Men series because he exists. Not Junior, not Senior. Listen, T'Challa's in there, and y'all could just bring him in there and do what needs to be done with his character. You could do that. I'm just saying that's it's on the table. It's on the table. Um. Also goes on to says uh, the third season of What If. Uh, without spoiling anything, that's where we start to feel crossover potential with animated projects. We've got Marvel Zombies coming down the road, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Um, and it's a very, uh, he said it's a very high school ensemble driven show with Peter Parker at the center. Okay. All right, cool. So, you know, it sounds like we got a lot more things coming uh, down the pipeline with um, uh, with uh, the animated series and the live action stuff so i don't know you guys let me know what things are you looking forward to in um and uh you know the upcoming animated stuff with disney plus um what things are you looking forward to maybe with the live action series like iron heart or wonder man um whatever you think let me know your thoughts in the comments below all right uh Yo, what you got? Uh, I'm not going to say that I'm tired of comic book movies because I will always watch them. However, I'm getting exhausted with the downfall of the MCU. I agree. Um, I think we all are, right? Like, nobody wants to keep seeing quality content get less in, you know, uh, I'm sorry, favorite IPs. You don't want to see them get less in the quality. Like, nobody wants to see that. Um, so, but I think you're. I think your sentiment is very similar to other people that like this genre 
Whereas it's like, yo, like I want these things to be good too. Like, I don't want to see these things be terrible for long. Like, no, you know, so I'm with you on that. I, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, there. Um, JN, uh, the script action scenes need to be better, similar to Falcon and Winter Soldier, and a veteran director would be great. No T'Challa, happy for a black cap. Um, yeah. Yeah, all right. I agree with all of that too. I think that that would be uh pretty solid on all levels. Um, JN, side note, Moon Girl is a great animated series. Cool. I haven't seen it, um, but I will take your word for it. Don't worry, guys. I still see your other stuff. I will get to it once we get a little closer uh, to the related content. All right. So now, now we can get back to this. X-Men firing. Now, remember, we talked about how uh, Bo DeMeo had recently been fired right before um, the uh, premiere of X-Men 97. This was completely out of the blue. No one saw this coming. It was weird. We was like, yo, how? Why? What is going on? And it caught everybody by surprise. Now, I've already told y'all, and we talked about this in my last video, um, there were a couple things, a couple rumors that were going around. Um, some people thought it was the OnlyFans. I didn't really think it was um, because his OnlyFans had been around for a couple of years and supposedly it had non-explicit stuff on there. Um, and then you had, um, you know, the fact that Brad Winderbaum, um, even the director that I spoke to, Jake uh, Castorena, uh, you know, he was everybody was talking good about Bo. Yo, they were like, yo, Bo did great. Bo did this two seasons and the two seasons were fire and this and that. Like everyone was saying positive things about Bo DeMeo, but the man deleted his social media. He got fired on his day off. I, nobody knows and i was like yo the only thing i could think of at that point was did he do something illegal like was it is that what happened like nobody could really un explain this now the other thing that i said now uh this was right before i did the last live so i didn't see this update but i was waiting for some of the insiders to actually say something you know like people that got all these inside connections like somebody gotta crack this mystery and we do have one insider this is from um uh, Jeff Snyder. So we got at least two somewhat reliable rumor uh, folks out there. Um, and they are the ones that uh, supposedly cracked this mystery. At least we have something. Now, again, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but we do have something here about what happened with Bo DeMeo. And according to Snyder, he says that uh, DeMeo is a nice guy, but impossible to deal with. Like truly an absolute nightmare to deal with on a daily basis. He's been really annoying Marvel leadership for a while now, and it has nothing to do with the fact that there's a lot of diversity in LBGTQ stuff in X-Men. So that is not the issue. Uh, it's just that he's really prickly and difficult to work with. Um, he goes on to say, this insider also suggested that DeMeo's activity on OnlyFans did not go over well with his Disney bosses who found some of his behavior creepy. Whoa. Okay. Well, if this is true, maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe, hey, maybe I was wrong on that. Um, that's, uh, yikes. Yikes. I mean, I don't know what he was doing. Um, I don't know what he was doing on his OnlyFans. Um, all I saw was just the, you know, reports and stuff. People saying like, yo, he was, you know, it's not like he was posting crazy pictures or nothing like that. I mean, if you go to his Instagram, he was always posting like workout shirtless pictures or whatever, but whatever. Um, I, I don't know what he could have posted on, you know, OnlyFans to make them uncomfortable or creepy. Um, but it sounds like, you know, the bigger fault here, if this insider is true, if it's true, it sounds like it was a, a workplace situation. Um, what I find kind of interesting is keep in mind, Bo DeMeo also, he also was the one he wrote an early script for Blade. So I'm actually kind of curious what that script was. So he is a big Marvel fan now. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, it's saying here that he was difficult to work with and that he was a nightmare. 
Ah, yikes. Yikes. Um, I don't know what this man could have done, um, but it says that they were dealing with it for years. My only thing is, I'm like, if if he was so bad to work with, why didn't y'all fire him earlier? You know, unless y'all just saw that his work was so good with the X-Men that y'all was like, man, we am tired of this man. Hey, but that, that X-Men script is fire. Hey, hey, let him write it and then we'll fire him later. You know, I I don't know. That's the way it's looking. That's the way it's looking. But, um, you know, and listen. Let's also, we have not heard Bo DeMeo's side of anything yet. Um, and let's not pretend, let's not pretend like this also is not a running stigma in the entertainment world. And unfortunately, this is also a stigma that applies to black entertainment as well. People that are difficult to work with. Now, usually this is more of um, a issue with black women, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it got applied here as well. Um, again, I'm not saying that they're racist. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that it is something that exists in Hollywood where when you're dealing with minority uh, creators and let's just say they have a certain standard, let's say they have a certain work ethic or something like that, the tolerance seems to be shifted when it's them versus someone else. So, you know, listen, I've heard stories about Tom Cruise. I've heard reports about Tom Cruise being very strict in how he handles a set. I still haven't heard nobody putting the difficult label on him. Is there a double standard? I don't know. I'm not there. I'm just saying what I hear all the time. And again, it is a stereotype label that does happen to lean more on minorities than I've seen, you know, otherwise. So maybe it is true, though. Maybe he is a jerk. Maybe he is like, you know, a, a, a real nightmare to work with. I don't know. But y'all let me know. What do you think about this rumor? Again, it's just a rumor. Um, what do you think about it? Do you think that there's anything to it? Um, whatever you think, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, all right. We got our last thing for the night. We're going to talk about the X Men, but hold on. I got to give, uh, okay, hold on. I'm gonna give him, give him some props later. Uh, it's a little spoilery, so I won't go into that yet. Um, Let's see. Okay, we'll say that later. Um, oh, we can do that. LeVar, what you got? Uh, just a thought, brother. What do you think about uh, instead of Age of Ultron, we had the Kang Dynasty instead? How do you think that play out? Um, so I would say that Instead of Age of Ultron, you're talking about you're talking about Age of uh, uh, Kang Dynasty back in 2015 ish, right? Um, I don't think that would have worked, and the reason why I think that would not have worked, or uh, better yet, the reason why I don't think that would have been a good time is because when it comes to uh, Kang the Conqueror, you're dealing with the multiverse. And when you're dealing with the multiverse, you're dealing with variations and variants of certain characters. I think that it was actually smart for Marvel to use these characters now and to go into that phase now because we have the X-Men, we have more characters to play with to get different variations with. Um, if we're thinking about it in hindsight in 2015, the most you would have gotten was an evil Tony Stark an evil captain america an evil you know or whatever you would have gotten an alternate you wouldn't even have had t'challa yet you wouldn't even have had spider-man yet you know so i think that um uh doing the kang dynasty earlier would have been a mistake or even if they did it and did the best they could we would have been robbed of actually seeing a lot of variants and stuff at that time so I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with the fact that uh 
of the order that they went in. Um, let's see. Uh, Nivlak, thank you. I, I hope I said that right. Uh, cheers and much love for all the content you share. Thank you so much for the uh, for the support. Really, really appreciate you on that. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Lavry, what you got? Uh, thank you again. Uh, about the fans voicing their opinions, I wish the media could help make the separation between real criticisms and being toxic. So, you know, and I think that that's, that's hard because unfortunately you also have fans that are, that are blurring the lines, you know? So like, it's, it's hard for the media to separate when you sound, and I'm not accusing you of course, but like, if you sound just like the people that are actually haters or toxic, how is anyone going to separate the two? I mean, just a perfect example. You had people sitting here accusing me of sexism with recast T'Challa saying that I hated women and that I hated Shuri when I was sitting here literally advocating for them to give Shuri her own show. I literally was saying, let's uplift them rather than just passing the mantle because I, and I predicted this. I said that fans were not going to receive her if you just, quickly shove her into the role rather than giving their time to transition it right however you had other people online that were also saying recast t'challa and they those small minority they were out here hating on women hating on female characters and for whatever reason people were like oh you said recast t'challa you said recast t'challa y'all must be the same and that was the problem. So I had to go out of my way to constantly correct and constantly defend against something I wasn't even supporting because these people that were louder or more consistent, they were blurring the lines and messing it up for the vast majority of people that were not being sexist and they were not being bigoted. We just wanted T'Challa back. We actually were cool with T'Challa and Shuri sharing the same screen together, both having the mantle. It was not a problem. So I think that that's more of an issue with like, if you have a legit criticism, take a little bit more responsibility in how you're voicing your critique. Make sure that you don't sound like the toxic people. That's all. Don't leave that up to the, to the media. I mean, listen, and I, I'll say this again. You know, and I'm not trying to brag or nothing, but when uh, media outlets were hitting me up about recast T'Challa, I had to be very conscious of what I was saying because I saw how some of them were trying to twist the words or the narrative. Um, I'm looking at you. Uh, I want to say it was Daily Beast. I want to say somebody came out there and put out this uh, uh, twisted headline. And they were sitting here talking about, oh, recast T'Challa is a sexist movement. And y'all literally talked to me for like 15 minutes. And I literally dispelled every single one of those things. But they led with that headline and they misconstrued the entire narrative. So I had to make sure that at the very least, you're not going to get that from me. You're not going to get, you know what I'm saying? Like I made sure if you're going to quote me, you're not going to get that nonsense from me. And that way people can tell the difference at least if the media is changing it up. So again, if you're going to go out there and tell these companies, yo, we don't like this. Yo, uh, let's say this. We don't like Madam Web. Don't sit here and talk about we don't like Madam Web because women are in it. That's not a good articulate argument. And you sound like a sexist, toxic person. Now, it's different if you sit here and say, yo, the writing in Madam Web was terrible. The direction of Madam Web was terrible. The characters in Madam Web were not relatable. That's different. You can't sit here and say that that's toxic because that can be applied to anything. So I think people, again, we got to be more, um, we have to be more uh, conscientious of like how we're making our critiques. I mean, I'm sorry for those of y'all that don't like wokeness, you sound silly. If you talk about X-Men being woke, you sound silly because X-Men has always been about modern progressive ideas. It doesn't matter whether it's about trans people, whether it's about sexuality, whether it's about whatever. It's a, It covers that umbrella of 
everything, all of it. So if you only sound like I don't like diversity, I don't like inclusion, I don't like other things outside of the main, you are going to sound toxic. Now, if you have a problem with, man, I don't like how this character is depicted. Uh, this is not from the source material and therefore it's not very relatable. That's that's valid. You're entitled to that opinion. But if you just sitting here sounding like a hater. Hey, if the media going to label you like look what they say, if a hit dog hollers, you know, there you go. But thank you so much for that, LeBron. I appreciate you. Uh, dang, man, they cooking something. I'm hungry now, man. I can't. Hey, man, what y'all cooking? I'm hungry. Anyway, uh, Team Black, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Yes, uh, I saw the trailer. I wanted to play it, um, but they wouldn't let me. Um, it's, it's cool. Whatever. You know, I'm a Michael Keaton fan, so I'm with it. Either way, I'm I'm all with it. Um, <laughs> what is this here? Larry, what's going on? Uh, E-Man, I just bought a 12-pack of Coke. And one can was pretty much uh, empty, but uh, with no holes or seams. Uh, it's a mystery. Give me my Coke or give me death. Man, Larry, who out here taking your Coke, bro? I don't understand. What, what's happening with your Coke? I'm sorry to hear about it. Listen, enjoy your pop. Yes, enjoy your pop. I don't care who, I don't care who disagrees. Enjoy your pop. Just want to put that out there. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate you always. Uh, Arthur, what you got? The Bo DeMeo story reminds me of Isaiah Washington's treatment on Grey's Anatomy and he uh, his being difficult as a reason he was fired. Hey, again, I don't have enough details on the situation um, to, to really comment on it. All we have are rumors, but maybe, maybe. I mean, at least Isaiah Washington, he's spoken up about it. So at least we heard his side of things. But I don't know. Maybe one day uh, Bo DeMeo will speak up. Well, maybe we'll get his side of the truth. You know, we'll see. Um, but thank you so, so much for that. Um, you know, OK, let's go into this one. And uh, this will be a good segue into what we're doing now. Uh, Riga, what you got? Is it worth uh, worth it to watch the original X-Men series before watching 97? Or would it suffice with watching recaps? I don't want to wait. Uh, too long to watch 97. So um, I would say um, do what you have time for, right? Your time is valuable to you. Um, I personally rewatched the entire old series and I found a lot of benefit in it mainly. Be a matter of fact, don't hold me to this, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work myself into making a theory video for y'all. I know trying to go back to my roots, um, about what fun little Easter eggs in the original series that Marvel can still use today for the X-Men. Um, there are a lot of things in the original series that we took for granted, especially if you grew up with the show. There were so many things you did not remember or that you probably forgot because they literally did it in like two seconds. You know, like it's literally if you blink, you miss it. Um, so uh, I'm probably I'm actually probably going to go back and rewatch it again just so that I can go back and do a video for y'all um, because uh, I think that there were a lot of things that were referenced. There were a lot of things that people forgot um, that is worth exploring. So if you have time. I would say go ahead and go rewatch it. Just remember, though, just remember uh, after season three, I want to say the budget got cut. So the animation starts to get a little wonky. The story gets a little watered down. Um, they were struggling. They were struggling. You're going to start seeing uh, less X-Men pop up. You're going to see uh, the, the 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 animation looks bad and stuff. So just keep that in mind. But I would just say that there's this show does make a lot of references to the previous series so um it would help if you did rewatch it but i wouldn't say that it's absolutely necessary i don't think it's necessary but it would help it would help um but you know it's all good we live in a world of the internet somebody going to catch you up anyway uh but thank you so much all right um uh, oh, you said here what now? Uh, thank you, LeBron. Uh, about the Kang Dynasty, I meant what if the main Kang showed up, 
retreated and came back with full force after the infinity saga um i think that would have been still maybe a little too confusing for people maybe um but i could see how it could work i could see like if he came as like a one and done and then all of a sudden came back later i could see how maybe that could work um but it also might have been too distracting maybe uh but i you know I, I, i'd say 50 50 i'd say it's 50 50 you know depending on who's writing it what story angle you go with um because we did have time travel later on um but you know the time travel thing wasn't a real thing until later on in the franchise so you basically would have been introducing time travel earlier which could have opened up a bigger can of worms um so i I'm going to lean no, but I think I'm going to give it a possible. I'm going to give it a possible. But thank you for clearing that up. I appreciate you. All right. So let's get into um, the X-Mon 9 to 7. Hold on. Um, and let's go. All right. Let's talk about X-Men 97. Um, I'm going to give you your, my uh, reaction, soft review, maybe. Um, now, for those of you that know how we get down with this, I'm going to briefly go over some of the episode. Um, I am going to include spoilers. So if you have not watched X-Men 97 episode one or episode two, I am going to go through it. It will be spoilers. This is your spoiler alert. It's all good. Wash your hands, wash your butts. I'll see you guys next week. Um, and we will be covering this. Just so you guys know, we will be covering this on Wednesdays. I'm I'm sorry. I should have covered this last Wednesday when it came out. I got a little busy. I had some things I had to do. But we will pick up Wednesday nights. Okay? Wednesday nights. Um, we will be covering every episode of the X-Men 97. And I can't wait. Because we have to talk about episode three. I'm not going to tell y'all what happened. I did get a chance to see it. Oh, my God. Uh, but we will talk about that later. But anyway, again, for those of y'all that have not watched, it's all good. Have a good time. Appreciate y'all. Um, but we are going to talk about episode one and episode two. So now's your time. Take, take it easy. All good. No hard feelings. Check y'all later. All right. Are we clear? Everybody gone. Let me see. Andrew, I see you only saw the first episode. Okay. Hey, you're going to have to bounce after the second one then. <laughs> um, but all right. So we're going to get into the first episode here. Um, first of all, let's go. Let's go. This, this, this done started off. Like, I can't tell y'all how happy I am that you guys have finally been able to see it. Because I, I saw it a couple weeks ago. Um, as you've already seen on my channel, I did our um, I did my interview with the director um, and he already told y'all, if you like them first couple episodes, those are the slowest episodes for the whole season. There's only 10 episodes. OK, so there's only 10 episodes. But I don't know about y'all, but I feel like even in these short 25 minutes, they are packing a lot in these episodes and i'm here for all of it okay i'm here for every piece of x-men 97 okay um but my god this this was it, the second they announced it i was in the second we heard that theme song i was excited the second i saw this i was like if we don't hurry up and get to the point where everybody else sees it and what i'm seeing everybody's online everybody's loving it so we're gonna talk about a couple moments in here we're gonna talk about a couple things um like i said i'd encourage you to go watch uh my interview if you haven't already um but let's kind of go through the episode and um go through what happened now first of all of course um we see here the the f out of here clan i'm sorry every time i see this it's f o now this is friends of humanity but it you know, it's the internet. I'm like, man, that's the F out of here, right? Hey, 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 F, F, O, come on, that's F out of here. That's what, that's what that is to me, anyway. Um, but we see the friends of humanity out here, and just in case you did not realize, these people, this group, does represent, 
you know, a typical hate group. Now, I don't care what your politics are. I don't care what they are. Okay. I don't care if you're a lefty. I don't care if you're a righty. I don't care. I don't care. But I want you to understand that these characters, these tropes do fill in as representatives of or symbols of things that happen even in today's modern world. So this Friends of Humanity group, insert whatever hate group you want here. That's who they represent. Now, they also represent the extreme of the hate groups, okay? Not every hate group that we know of or not every group with certain values are violent. They're not kidnapping people. We're not saying that. But these do represent the extreme of certain groups. So let's just kind of remember that. Um, the same way the X-Men represent the extreme of certain minority groups. So that's kind of what we're going here, all right? So we see here that they've got, um, they they uh, captured Roberto. Um, and, you know, woo, listen, they put some respect on my man Scott right here. Scott came in. Listen, the second my man came in and started using his beams to dodge around, I was like, oh, we finna work. We working. My man Scott been practicing. Because, uh, listen, I seen him work in the previous episodes. I ain't never seen him do that. He ain't never do, 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 do. I ain't never see him dance. I ain't never see him do the Casper slide with his eye beams and stuff. But now my man is working. I like it. I like it. And he was giving them folks the hands too. But then come on through with it. Y'all already know what it was. Mm, here come the goddess. I need y'all to just look at this for a minute. Look at the queen goddess storm coming in. And wrecking shop. This, listen, you already know what it is. That's my girl right there. That's my girl. Okay. Storm has been my girl. You know what I'm saying? She came in, she spit her little haiku, her, her, her little poems, the haikus, and all that stuff. You know, got the storm going, the lightning bolts, and everything. I love every second of this to the T. I love it. I love it. I love it. We'll get back to her in a minute. But this is what I'm talking about in terms of you got if you blink, you will miss it. You had a whole Spider-Man Easter egg pop up. And again, if you missed it, you probably did. But here it is. You see the Daily Bugle. What is the Daily Bugle? Yes, that is the newspaper that Peter Parker works at. Look at the top left corner. What does it say? Is Spider-Man a mutant? Yes, they are talking about Spider-Man uh, in this X-Men 97 uh, era. I think that's Ban Banshee too, ain't that? I think that's Banshee over there on the cover. Um, the Hellfire Gala, so Emma Frost is around. We already know that. But again, these are all characters that were kind of sort of referenced, whether it was in the animated Spider-Man series or if it was referenced in the X-Men series. So we know that they exist. We know that it's a shared universe. So that's pretty cool uh, that we're getting that. Um, now, of course, we saw Roberto, uh, you know, they're bringing back the mutant collars and all that. We'll get back to that. Um, and then, of course, you see here that, um, you know, Professor X is no longer here. He is gone. Um, and Scott and Gene are the ones that are working with the UN at this point as the correspondents. Now, a couple of things here I wanted to point out. Now, I just want to remind people. Yes, Professor X is no longer here. We saw the death certificate or whatnot, but I need y'all to remember in case you forgot from the last uh, episode of Ant of X-Men, um, he's not actually dead. Matter of fact, if you look at the intro theme of this show, they literally have Professor X as like one of the title characters. So he's not gone forever. Um, so basically you have Professor X, he had gotten assassinated um but he was dying in the last episode and as he was dying they contacted the shiar uh alien race and they basically teleported him away so what does that mean that means obviously professor x is going to come back they told you in that episode that yes the shiar we can save him yes we have um more weapons you know we have more uh, not weapons we have more health care uh, that you humans can't even think about. And they basically teleported him up. Now, here's the thing. 
do not be surprised if Professor X, because it's been a year, okay? It's been a year now. Do not be surprised if he comes back into this show. And also, and I'll predict this now, don't be surprised if he comes back and he can walk. He might be able to just walk because, again, y'all got all this medical technology. Why not? But here's my issue. Y'all been to space. And keep in mind, Professor X had a whole love connection or whatever with Lelandra, you know. Y'all had all that technology. I'm just saying, if he comes back and starts walking, y'all had that technology and y'all couldn't have helped that brother out before? You couldn't have done that before at all? Now, y'all also know, y'all also know, and this ain't new to the MCU, Professor X, if he can walk, and he up there with his little boo thing up there, you know he clapping them space cheeks. You know he is. You know he getting them Shi'ar cheeks. Has to. That's why it's been a year. He could have came back two months after. But my man is spending his sweet little vacation time in space. Exploring a new frontier. You already know it's happening. You know it. Listen, we grown, okay? We grown. We all grew up with the show. We know what's happening now, okay? Professor X think he's slick. Something else I want to bring up to y'all attention. Did y'all notice what this was? This is one of the reasons why, and I'm going to make a whole video on this. I think I'm going to have to make a video. This is one of the reasons why Brad Winderbaum already told us that the X-Men 97, they're in another timeline. They're not on the sacred timeline. And this had to be a great example how. These mofos had a whole Zoom call. They had a whole Zoom call in the 90s. Clearly, this was not our 90s. I don't know. If you go back and you go watch the show, they had smartphones. They were flip phones, but they had Zoom calls on their smartphones. Now, as a kid, I didn't think nothing about this because I was just like, meh, Professor's rich. Meh, he's got access to technology. Eh, whatever. They had everything. They had the internet in the 90s with high speed. And we didn't blink. Not one of us sat here and asked, how? Not one. Nobody. Nobody sat here and said, how the heck did they call them? What the? How did they make a hot spot out of? None of y'all asked that question. I didn't. I didn't. I know I didn't. So this is how I know that they are in a completely different universe. They was on the Jetsons before we even knew it. Come on now. Come on now. Anyway. Um, there's some other fun things that they were doing that we didn't consider, but I'll try and say that for a video as well. So anyway, we see here that, yes, Professor's gone. We got Gene uh, and we got Cyclops taking over. They're doing all the uh, stuff here. But this is what I need y'all to pay attention to. Look at look at my girl. I want y'all to look at this queen right here. This goddess Storm. OK, would y'all look at first of all, they made her darker. Shout out to the X-Men crew for making her dark skinned. Shout out to that. Thank you. But not only that, do y'all look at the African cheekbones? Come on, cheekbones. Come on. Listen, that is given straight up west side of Africa. Okay? She, she clearly, I know I want to say she was Kenyan, if I'm not mistaken. Okay? I I want to say she is Kenyan in her roots. But I'm here for the cheekbones and the dark skin complexion. This is the storm I've always hoped we could get. And I love the fact that we got it. Look at the cheekbones. And she's fine. Look at that woman. Okay? No disrespect to Hallie. No disrespect. But ma'am, you was never it. That was never a good casting. We all knew Angela Bassett should have been Storm. I love Hallie now. But no, nah, that wasn't it. This is my storm. That's the storm I want. Oh, yes. Yes. That Listen, that's the storm on my chest. I like it. 
So, with that said, we also got some other characters. Now, I, I think this was overblown. People was all I saw people online tripping over Gambit wearing the shirt. Listen, for some of y'all people that are young and just did not know, people wore shirts like this in the 90s. The uh Bill and Ted, they wore crop shirts. Fresh Prince, Bel Air, Will Smith, he wore a shirt like that. This was a 90s thing. And I'm seeing a lot, I'm saying way too many people trying to import their uh uh you know 2024 mindset on the styles of what happened in the 90s that's not how it went down people wore this and they were fine okay that that was just a style decision so that doesn't mean that they're making gambit gay you know that's not what listen gambit has been after rogue from day one (laughs) like if tell me you haven't watched the x-men without telling me you haven't watched the x-men at gambit loves him some rogue that's all he was engaged. Did y'all forget? My man was engaged and he had a whole marriage going on. See, some people forgot. Some people forgot. But anyway. So anyway, you know, we got Scott here. He's back in charge, um, you know, and uh, um, but they're dealing with uh, the loss of the professor not being around. And that is clearly going to be uh, an issue for them. Um, but one of the things that uh, also happened is like, yo, What is going to happen with them because Jean is pregnant, right? We see Jean is pregnant. We see that she is uh, clearly going to um, be expecting. Uh, Of course, a lot of you comic fans already know who that baby is. Uh, The previous series already teased it as well. Um, But they also have to. But listen, let me tell you something. This right here. This is how I knew this show was still on point. Because they kept this energy going of Logan versus Scott. When I tell you, when that scene came up and Logan was like, you know the worst thing about the professor being gone? You. Emotional damage. (laughs) I mean, Scott was like, (laughs) Logan be stinging. Logan does not hold back and that's what this is the wolverine that made him popular later on keep in mind don't be fooled by that hugh jackman nonsense i like hugh jackman okay but what i'm saying is logan was never meant to be the main character he was always supposed to be the side dish that we enjoy but he was never the main course meal okay he was always the supporting character but man he would come in and he'd be dope He'd have just the he'd be the 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 grumpy dwarf, you know, the the grumpy whatever, you know, like he would poke and and fight with Cyclops. And I was here for that energy. I loved it. I loved it. Um, Then we move on. We see them going after uh, Garrick. This is the guy who uh, supposedly assassinated um, Professor X. Um, But they also, um, you know, did. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Before that, I have a gripe. I have an issue. We have to clear something up. I told y'all before that this show has always been about progression and all that stuff, but it's also been about a love story, too, and a couple different love stories. Yes, we have Gene and Scott. Yeah, we got the love triangle with him and Wolverine. We got all that, right? But let me just tell you something. This show X-Men 97 has been doing rogue bogus. Bogus. Now, we will talk about what happens in episode two. I know y'all seen it already, but I'm going to talk about right here, right now. And this was something that I started to realize even while watching the previous episodes. They have always done rogue bogus from the beginning. In case you forgot, Rogue has the the ability where if she touches somebody, she absorbs their life essence, their memories, powers, whatever, drains that person. And basically, it makes her unable to have human contact with other people. Now, listen, shout out to Gambit, because Gambit from day one has not cared about that whatsoever. Gambit was like, yo, (laughs) Sherry, (laughs) I will risk it all for you. Gambit will do that for you. Like, Gambit don't care. Okay, Gambit will go in a whole coma just to kiss Rogue. 
That's how much of a ride or die this man is. Maybe some would say that's how thirsty it is. Whatever the case is, but this series has done, and I'm talking about the whole series, they've done Rogue Bogus. Now, again, we'll talk about what happens in season two, but let me just point one little thing out. If her whole problem is the fact that she cannot deal with human touch, right? That's her issue. Tell me why not one time have they ever thought about, and they have this, by the way, they have this at their disposal. Why has no one ever thought about putting the collar on Rogue? Somebody please explain that to me. What does this collar do? This collar temporarily turns off people's mutant powers. They have that at their disposal. Why is no one putting the collar on Rogue so she can live her life and maybe hang out with Gambit a little bit more? I'm just saying, easy fix right in front of our faces. It's existed for years. This collar did not just show up. They had that collar all the way in season one and season two and three of the X-Men. I'm just asking, why has no one thought, hey, you know what? If I put this collar on, I don't have to be all depressed. I don't have to go around sneaking around the mansion, doing other things with other people. I don't have to do all that. Just, just wondering why that hasn't been explored. Just saying. Anyway. Just saying, people can wear collars, you know what I'm saying? Like, what up? Anyway, uh, what else we got here? So, uh, I feel bad for my man Gambit, but we're gonna talk about that later. Uh, so we go back to the interrogation where we see here that, um, you know, the guy who supposedly, uh, you know, um, assassinated Professor X, uh, he's in prison, but he's the one that knows about what's going on, uh, with the secret plot to get rid of the mutants and all that, and man. Cyclops was like, man, let me tell you something. Have you met my wife? I don't think you have. Pow! She came right into his mind, went all up in there, and she was going deep, and she found out all the scary stuff that was going on. And yo, shout out to the animation. Yo, how they gonna slip in some horror in here? Who knew that they were gonna slip some horror into this at the same time? Now, I'm gonna just give y'all a little tip. I'm gonna just give y'all a little something real quick. It's not a spoiler. But I'm going to tell y'all this. For episode three, they tap into these vibes, these vibes. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to tell you how it is. But these vibes get tapped into, and it's going to be something to see. It is going to be something to see. It is fantastic um, and absolutely one of my favorite elements of the next episode. So you can definitely count on that. Um but the way the animation is dealing with this kind of stuff, it's we've never seen that before to this level in this whole franchise. And they do a great job. You'll know it when you see it. Um, and by the way, because y'all probably already saw my little short where I talked about, um, you know, one of the biggest problems with X-Men. Kudos to my girl, Jean. Went through all that psychic trauma and didn't faint not once. Not a single fainting. I was so proud. I was, because, listen, the second she got in there, I thought she was gonna. I was like, Cyclops ain't even there to carry you or nothing, and nobody was gonna pick you up, and you pregnant? I was worried, but she held it together. So shout out to her. Um, What is this here? Oh, yeah. Okay. Then uh, we see them going out to the desert. They got to go stop Master Mold and all that. And y'all, let me tell you something. This scene right here is how I knew that they knew the assignment. They understood the assignment. I ain't never seen Cyclops have such a cold moment than the greatest superhero landing we've ever seen. Period. Period. That 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 moment will go down as the greatest superhero movie landing we've ever seen. Greatness. Greatness. And it was just one of the best moments. But I'm going to tell you another moment 
that topped it for me. And it came right after that. I mean, this this whole episode had nothing but gold per episode, per per couple of minutes, I should say. When my man dropped one of the best lines that I, I'm just going to put this in my vocabulary. Give him the forecast. Oh. And then the goddess showed up. Goosebumps. Can y'all see him? Goosebumps. I got goosebumps when this man said, mm, give him the forecast. Ah! Oh! And then Storm came through. Wind, water, storm. You know, whatever she says. And then for them to put some more respect on this goddess's name, y'all heard what they said? Omega level uh, uh, mutant threat on the... Te- <laughs> And y'all gonna correctly categorize her too? Listen. This this is how you this is how you supposed to work. This is how you do it. Woo. And then we got this other scene, this classic combo. It was teased in the in the uh trailer. We got to see the charged up animantium. I was like, yo, what y'all finna do with this? My man said, yo, more turn into blob shot this man like a missile and exploded oh my god i've seen a lot of sentinel fights this had to be the easiest best one this has to be it 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 was i don't know how you top this you had one episode and you had at least five epic moments i mean moments that we are not going to forget that was amazing. And, and, and again, remember from my interview, this is the slowest episode. If this is slow, what's fast? Like, I don't what what? So we got Roberto da Costa, aka Sunspot. He's finally here. He got a chance to show off his powers. So, you know, he'll probably become a mainstay member uh, later on. Um, But then we also got Gene and Cyclops, and they got to give the bad news. But Wolverine's like, man, forget your bad news. We know what you about to do. You about to leave. Now, let me also mention this. We talked about how there was a lot of respect put on Storm's name. But I th- I did not appreciate this one moment where I would say that it was a little disrespectful. Now, if you understand the context of when you watch the first couple seasons of the show and all that, this is where I got a little upset. Just a little. Not mad, but just a little like, what the hell? What y'all talking about? You know, and it was it this scene right here. Because as Scott and Gene were sitting there telling the team, like, yo, we got an announcement. And when Wolverine ta- said, hey, y'all leaving us, we already know. Jubilee going to sit here and be like, wait a minute. Scott and Gene were like the first students of Professor X. Who going to lead us? How you going to ask that question? And Storm is standing right there. I don't like that. Why? In the first couple episodes, when Jubilee, of all people, were introduced to the X-Men, hey, this is Scott and Jean, uh, Scott's the leader. Oh, by the way, Storm, she's second in command. When did that stop? Even in the comics, Storm was the one that was the leader when Cyclops was off there tripping or whatever. She beat Cyclops to become the leader of the X-Men. She's the leader of the Morlocks, or she was until she gave it back. Like, Storm ain't no joke. Is she a joke to y'all? I'm just saying. She's gonna sit there and say that when the girl, she's standing right there. She would lead y'all. And if y'all don't put some respect on her name. Anyway, we move on. We get to the big little cliffhanger. And of course, we see uh, Magneto in the office. Just one little thing real quick to look at. And I love the details. Did you notice how he passed the book to them? 
this is how I know these people know what they're talking about. Now, other lazy artists probably could have just been like, oh, he tossed the book or whatever. Look at the edges of the book and how they are lit up. See how they're not lit up anymore? They were lit up. Why? Because my man was using the magnetism of the metal on the tips of the book to hand it over. That level of detail shows me that y'all care about this franchise. Y'all care about this. I love it. I love it. I love it. That just that just that little they didn't have to. They didn't have to. Nobody would even care. I love the fact that they just did that little bit. Oh, makes me appreciate them so much. And then, of course, you know, Magneto was like, uh, what's up, suckers? <laughs> Y'all in my house now. <laughs> what you think? Boy, I know that man Cyclops was hurt. He was like, man, the professor don't trust me no more. Professor didn't even leave that man the bank account number. He ain't leave him no passwords, nothing. They just been living there. My man can't get no withdrawals from the account, nothing. Can't even get into the screensaver. No, just can't even open up the, the safe or nothing. Just, oh, well, everything to Magneto. Sorry. Oh, boy, that man is hurt. I tell you. I tell you. Uh, but anyway, that is all for episode one of uh, X-Men uh, 97. Um, this is the point where I ask you guys, give me your rating for uh, X-Men uh, 97. Um, let's see. So while you guys are doing that, uh, I will think about my rating here because I'm doing this on the spot. Uh, let's see. The writing I thought was fantastic. Um, the, I, I mean, it's animation, but I would say the portrayals of the characters were also really, really on point. Um, I have not recalled having anything hit us with so many iconic moments, um, from hit them with the forecast or, um, you know, the Sentinel fight, the action. I mean, all of this stuff in just 30 minutes. I, this is tough. I like. I don't know if there was anything bad. I I don't know. I think I'm gonna give it a nine, and that's being safe. I'm doing it on the spot, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a nine. This is a hell of an introduction. This is a great way to get me. In, mm, I'm going to give it a nine and a half. I'm going to give it a nine and a half because it made me feel good. I felt great. I felt great. Re and I felt good rewatching it. I'm going to give it a nine and a half. So it might be on the high side. I don't care. Uh, but let's see where y'all landed with it. We got 10, nine, 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 eight, eight, 10, nine, uh, nine and a half. Uh, <laughs> eight, nine, nine, nine. All right, nine, uh, nine, nine, uh, nine and a half. Okay, listen, hey, that works for me. You know, it sounds like everybody is uh on the same page. We enjoyed it, that's what matters. We enjoyed it. Um, all right, so before we get into episode two, let me grab some of these comments here, um, and then we will get started. Um, Okay, Team Black. Uh, finally, they got my boy Cyclops right. Yeah, I know he's a terrible dad and husband. Still my guy. That's all right. That's all right. And they are, so far, they are doing him right now. I, I would say that they might be protecting him a little bit, but they are putting some respect on his name as well. So I will get you uh, on that. Thank you so much for that contribution. Puma, uh, they finally had the correct, uh, correct skin tone for Storm. Listen, you know I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, Larry, what you got? X Men has pretty much been uh perfect so far. Also, Beetle Juice and Penguin look great. Much love, bro. Thank you so much, Larry. Always appreciate you. Um, yeah, I've seen the Beetle Juice, liked it. Cool. I probably need a little more. Uh, Penguin, I saw it. I'm not impressed. Um, it was okay. Um, but take that with a grain of salt because I'm just not a Penguin fan. Um, I'm talking about the character, not Colin Farrell, his portrayal. I'm pretty sure he will do a great job. 
I'm pretty sure it'll be a cool little mafia type of story. Um, but I'm just not personally excited about Penguin, especially if there is no Batman. And yeah, I just don't like the character. But um, I'm with you on everything else. Thank you so, so much. Um, okay, we'll save that for later. Um, okay, I will save those for when we talk about episode two. So let's get into episode two. Um, so uh, wait, I should change the banner. Duh. Bam, there we go. All right, so episode two of x-men 97 once again if you have not watched it this is the time where you need to bounce uh because we're talking about spoilers here um but yes episode two um i thought that this was um an interesting way to just really start off the next chapter um you know the last one i think was kind of more for nostalgia purposes but now we're really starting to get into the nitty-gritty of the story and the plot and where they're going with this so uh let's kind of go into it so first off of course we start where uh magneto of all people is out here actually saving people you know he's rescuing uh folks which is a very very big shift from what he was known for doing i mean he was known as a terrorist before um and magneto used to be a problem for a lot of people he used to be a problem especially for humans given his uh, very traumatic past um, but this was a scene that I really liked. Don't forget about the Morlocks who live in the sewers. These are mutants that live underground and, um, Magneto came and rescued them, you know, from the mutant hate group, you know, friends again, uh, friends of humanity. Um, he came and rescued them. And when I tell you, this was probably one of my favorite moments. This man said, I don't know what just happened. I just helped out them Morlocks. And by the way, I got to call out my boy, Professor X, because how the hell y'all going to let them mutants live in the sewer systems? And listen, this is partially on Professor X. Now, to be fair, he did invite them to come stay with them at the mansion. However, my man ain't give them no kind of resources. Professor X, you had all this money, all this resources. And when it came down to, uh, I think it was a Christmas episode in the fifth uh, season, I want to say, they had some twigs for a Christmas tree. You couldn't even get them a Christmas tree, bro? Jubilee had to give them the Christmas gifts just so that they could have a Christmas party. They, they didn't even have ramen noodles. They had the broth of ramen noodles. Talking about stay with us for Christmas dinner. S Professor, you couldn't send them no noodles? You couldn't send them no noodles at all? I get it. Maybe, you know, listen, it's a big transition to go from living in the sewers to living in the mansion. That's big. I understand. But I'm saying, Professor X was a billionaire. This man couldn't open up some project somewhere and put them up somewhere? You couldn't find a ranch in the middle of uh, of nowhere and, and set them up? You could at least help them live above ground. So Magneto said, listen, I don't know what Charles was doing, but all this money and resources I got to my disposal, oh, I put them up in Genosha. They're going to be fine in Genosha, and they're going to be all right. Yo. I like this Magneto. And if you think about it, especially if you look at the animated series, Magneto was never really a bad guy. He was bad because he was killer folks. But <laughs> he was a hurt person. And you know what they say, hurt people hurt people. And we get, we'll get to it later, but that's pretty much Magneto's whole point. Magneto was like, yo, y'all been hurting me, so I'm going to hurt y'all right back. So the fact that he is really going through these efforts to be better, I commend him on that. I like that because it's showing possible character growth. Possible. We don't know. Maybe he'll go back, but we'll see. Anyway, my man was like, yo, y'all was slacking, and we uh, 
we're gonna help out the poor people and look at scott mad why are you helping them poor people we don't want to help them poor. i'm just playing he wasn't mad about that <laughs> he just didn't trust magneto but um you know this is good uh tension though like why would he trust magneto they have been going back and forth fighting this dude and all of that so of course it was uh natural that they were gonna have trust issues and all that um but moving forward i love this moment too not you know you have gene here talking with storm and gene is having a real situation she is very concerned about her pregnancy she's concerned about her child basically growing up to be a mutant um and you know she's sitting here of course the best person to talk to is storm here um and she's conveying her concerns about like, yo, what are we supposed to do? We're going to bring this kid in the world. He's going to be hated. He's going to be discriminated against. He's going to be prosecuted and all this stuff, you know, persecuted by people. Like, I'm very worried. And Storm was like, yeah, well, you know, you're being a mother. But I like that, you know, even though Storm didn't go there with it, but this is very parallel to what minorities go through, especially black people. Um, you know, in other words, Gene is concerned. I would say that, you know what? I would say this. The closest that you can have is maybe having um, an interracial couple, right? So you, let's just say you have a couple where one is white, one is black. You will, if you're a white person and you've never had to deal with discrimination the same way that minorities deal with them, well, guess what? If you have a mixed race child, your child is going to have different life experiences than you would. So it's only natural that you would have concerns about that because one, you don't, nobody wants their child to go through any hardships. And two, it's even more difficult if you don't know how to protect them from that because you've never walked in those type of shoes. So it's very relatable in this sense for her to have these type of concerns because you know she is going to have to protect her child because as storm said that's what a mother would do a mother would be concerned about this right and you know what she's essentially also hinting at is having the talk the talk is something that again minority especially black parents usually have to have with their children when they talk about yo when you're dealing with the police, this is what you have to do. This is what you shouldn't do. If you're in a situation where you're the only black person in the room, this is how you should navigate. This is what you should not do. You know why? Because they just want you to come home safe. They don't want you to rile things up, even if they're wrong or right or whatever. We just want you to be safe. Um, so, you know, what's interesting about this is that I like that Storm doesn't deter her from keeping that truth from her son obviously won't be able to right like you're a mutant with two mutant parents but there's this mindset that i think is ridiculous of trying to shield children from the realities of the world and the oppression that they might face or the challenges they might face and there's some people that believe that we just shouldn't tell our children any of these things because if we just tell them that life is great and everything is going to be wonderful and you can do anything in life, what do you think is going to happen when those realities do hit them? You know, and if that were true, then how do you explain, I don't know, the centuries of minorities that knew these realities, knew these challenges, and still progressed? So clearly, telling your children the truth about the world is not a bad thing because we've already seen how people can persevere beyond that. So again, I loved what this conversation represented because again, because the X-Men are a metaphor for discrimination and so on, this is a reality just put in a fictional sense. So I thought that was great. Now we got to get to the drama. Yes, we saw Rogue. Yes, we saw her you know, feeling some type of way. And, you know, she's sitting here talking with Magneto. And yes, this does allude to the fact that they had a past at some point. Keep in mind, her mama, uh, Mystique, you know, they, they kind of all ran in them circles. They all ran in them circles. You know what I'm saying? 
Um, but uh, Rogue used to have a thing with, you know, Magneto. And she told him to stop. She said, yo, them days is over. Okay. Not today, sugar. You know, she was done. She was like, nah, man, we ain't doing that thing right now. Okay. That was the past. You know, yesterday's Rogue ain't today's Rogue. You know, so she called that off. Now, I think it's funny that don't nobody want to talk about the fact that they are damn near 40 years in terms of an age gap. Magneto is like 60 something years old, maybe 70. Rogue can't be more than 30, if that. We just gonna we just gonna bypass that. We we just gonna bypass that that he could be a whole grandpa. We're not gonna talk about that. Okay. All right. Whatever. Hey, hey, new world, different world. All right. Um, but hey, either way, they had their thing, you know. And um, we'll talk about how that can happen in a second. But before they can get it on or not get it on, the ops showed up. Um, and of course, they came here for Magneto specifically. They was like, listen, we got all these guns, they gonna pierce your magnetic stuff. We ready for you. He was like, Shut up, what y'all talking about? I do y'all forget I am the master of magnetism. How did y'all get here? Y'all didn't cut take no plastic cars or helicopters to get here. I will slice all of y'all. But because my man, Professor X, my man Charles was the way he was, Magneto was like, look, I put this on Charles. I'm gonna go with y'all peacefully. Y'all better respect that man's memory. Because that's the only reason I'm coming with y'all peacefully. And he let him collar him up and everything, and he went ahead. Now we fast forward, we get to the uh to the union, uh to the UN, and we see a nice little protest going on. Now, listen, don't forget the X-Men are symbolic of a lot of things, a lot of ide ideologies, and a lot of people. I don't think it's a coincidence that they are showing a bunch of people going to a government facility maybe even rioting, maybe trying to stop the legal actions from happening. Mm. But we see a bunch of folks show up, you know, no coincidence. Uh, and then we get this classic moment here. Um, now, for those of you that don't know, this is straight up from the comics. I mean, from this Magneto, uh, no, they're not trying to make him a zaddy or anything, but um this is straight up from the comics from the uniform uh also even from the pose where he is right there in shackles um there to face his crimes or whatnot so that is something that um you know again you can totally tell that the creators knew the material they knew what they were doing um and i absolutely love this moment um because you know while he was uh still committed to professor x's memory um you're seeing him talk about how not only is he alluding to his past and his tra traumatic childhood being a survivor of the holocaust but he's also talking about how everything humans have done to mutants so he's like listen y'all sitting here acting like i'm the terrorist meanwhile you guys are literally trying to commit genocide and attack all of us sound familiar i'm not gonna go there but if it sounds familiar you can kind of see how complicated that issue is who's right who's wrong it's a chicken and the egg type of situation well not really for some people but you know these mutants have been persecuted and discriminated against and literally been hunted down like animals meanwhile the establishment humans are sitting here acting like i mean we just trying to defend ourselves by exterminating all the people by exterminating all the mutants again might sound familiar i'm not gonna say it ain't nobody gonna come for me but you know it is a complicated issue that's going on so moving forward we also got uh gene she's starting to feel her issues uh, with the pregnancy, and I love how unprepared uh, Logan was. Uh, Wolverine was sitting there. She was like, oh my gosh, he's here. He's coming. 
My man first thing was like, where? Where's Apocalypse? What's going on? Pop them claws was ready and everything until she was like, no, stupid. It's the baby that's coming. Look at this man's face. This man was shooketh. He did not know how to process none of this. Listen to this. All this time, this man been fiending and fawning after Gene. And the one time she got she got the baby and everything, he, he don't know what to do. Logan, what if that was your kid? You ain't never thought about what you was going to do? You, you ain't thinking nothing. This man did not have two clues. He been through war. He been through fights, battles. He been in a couple relationships. This is the one other thing that spooked this man to the core. Didn't know how to process it. Anyway, let's fast forward back to the UN. We see here, uh, I, I think his name was the executioner or something like that. I forgot what his name was. Um, but we see here that the, the guy from the hate group is basically here to uh, take out Magneto. And yo, people are not putting enough respect on this man's name. Check out Morph. Morph turned into Colossus. He turned into Psylocke. He turned into um, uh, Hawk uh, uh, Angel or Archangel as well. What I think people forget about Morph, he's not just a shapeshifter. This man literally takes on other people's mutant abilities, or at least to some degree of them. That's actually really dope. It really makes me wonder if Morph is an Omega level mutant, because if you can copy other people's abilities, that's a lot. Mystique, she changes into other people, but I don't recall really seeing her take on other people's abilities. She just shapeshifts. Morph really turns into other people and takes on their attributes too. So I'm just saying, Morph might be that next level mutant. And if somebody can check if he's more, uh, mega level or not, I'd appreciate it. But I really love the fact that they're making Morph um, a bigger component in this whole series. They tried to bring him back in the old series too and do that. But I like what they're doing with him here uh, and really showing that, you know, he's a formidable, you know, formidable uh, uh, asset to the team. Um, we see here Cyclops getting his butt whooped. I'm a little surprised about this because Cyclops, you just had a whole intro where you was out here doing the Casper slide with your eye beams. Now you're getting poked in the eye and you can't do nothing. Um, I'm really starting to wonder, should he get like some contact lenses maybe instead? I don't like, maybe the visor ain't working for him. I don't know, whatever. Um, but the second you take them glasses off, he's done for. Um, but we get back to the hospital and we see yet another moment of discrimination. And this is where the medical uh, team, the hospital, will not deliver Gene's baby. Why? Because they don't work on mutants. Now, I know on the level that sounds discriminatory. I get it. But the doctor said, y'all powers be out of control. And we can't deal with those powers i can't say that he's wrong i mean granted in this whole series mutants powers usually don't manifest until they're teenagers but you have a couple mutants that have their abilities at birth as well now i would say that maybe they should have some sort of better efforts to deal with mutants on a medical level. But I'm just saying, I can see why they made this a little complicated. Okay. I mean, it's been years and y'all still don't have a mutant hospital. Come on now. But at the same time, I, I, I can understand either side. I can understand both sides, but the X-Men, I love the fact that they was like, man, we ain't got time for this. Suck that guy's memories, figure it out, and let's go ahead and deliver this baby. So they go ahead and do that. Then we get the uh, <clears throat> peaceful protesters uh, at the uh, Capitol, or I'm sorry, at the UN building. These peaceful, very, very peaceful people that only wanted to see um, a fair, fair uh, trial happen. Uh, we see them show up. We see Magneto is now protecting uh, the folks. Now, what's also interesting here is how even these politicians that were trying to persecute, that were trying to uh, uh, prosecute Magneto, that were against him, 
they started to see how even the people that they represent turned on them because the they were just trying to give him a fair trial. So these peaceful protesters were turning on the people that represented them because the people were not hateful enough. Isn't that a concept? But then we see uh, the, the executioner guy get ready. He takes a shot and, oh, my girl Storm. She jumps in the way to protect Magneto. And when I tell you this scene had to be so heartbreaking when she said, I can't feel the breeze. I can't feel the weather. Oh. That hit me. That hit me. That, listen, I know it's animation, but dang it, that was some good writing and some good acting. Because I had to put myself in her shoes right there. Somebody who was in tune with nature for almost all her life. Someone that could feel the weather on a different level. Keep in mind, even when Storm went to a different planet, she can feel the nature there, right? So the fact that she lost this intimate connection with Mother Nature. Man, man, that was deep. That was deep. Like that, that, this hurt my heart for her. And then Magneto took them suckers up to the sky and said, let me tell you something. I could drop y'all right now. I could step on y'all right now. All of y'all don't mean nothing to me. But if it was not on my boy Charles, I am trying to prove to y'all that I am better than what y'all think of me. And I put that on Charles. That man was spitting because I really thought we was going to get old Magneto. I really thought old Magneto was going to take that asteroid chunk and be like, pow, see y'all. I don't care. Forget all of y'all. We going to Genosha. I thought that's what was going to happen. But my man lived up to his word. He figured it out. And he was like, nah, we ain't going to do that right now. We ain't going to do that. And because of his actions, we actually got the UN pardoning Magneto and giving aid to Genosha, which basically created a free recognized nation of the mutants. Now, if you are familiar with the comics, you already know. Ain't no such thing as a good thing for the mutants. Just, it, mutants cannot have anything good. Just they never can. So this is a great gesture. I love the direction. But if I know the history of the mutants, this ain't going to last long. Yeah, It's just not. Because humans and their, their propensity of fear will always drive them to doing crazy stuff. Anyway, we flash forward. We see that baby Nathan Summers is finally here. Um, and of course, if those of y'all that don't know who Nathan Summers is, that is um, uh, Cable. That is Cable. So uh, just so y'all know, and this was already confirmed in the uh, old cartoon series as well. When Cable, the time traveler, showed up, Gene read his mind, found out that that was actually their future kid. Um, so I like how she's, you know, calling him this, uh, as if she didn't know who he was, but maybe she didn't, whatever. Um, but look at this. Y'all still got, mm, man, poor Logan. Logan just ain't never, he just never gonna win. My man ain't just never gonna, he just never can get, <sighs> listen, just as much as I talked about how they always was fainting in the old X-Men series. When I tell you this man, Logan, would say, Gene, every other episode, no matter what, Gene, it took this man maybe two, three seasons to stop, Gene, every single time, every time. This man was so mad that when Gene and Cyclops was getting married, he decided to stay in the danger room just to kill multiple Cyclopses. Bro, bro, how you this crazy over a woman? 
you ain't even have y'all y'all didn't even date like y'all you act like she you know you was dating her and then she left you and then like, you ain't get like you've had whole relationships but yet gene is the one now i believe we found out earlier no i think that was in the movies gene kind of helped fix his mind so maybe a love connection was made there maybe but i'm just saying it was my man he been struggling He's been struggling for a long time, okay? Uh, anyway, we go forward. <sighs> Hank, he's doing his science experiments. He finds out that the effects that happen to Storm are actually permanent, or at least that's the way they look and seem right now. Storm is absolutely devastated. Um, she leaves her message for the team uh, that she is uh, going to leave. Everybody in the uh, mansion is going through their own little drama right now. Um, looks like Magneto is actually going to get him some sugar after all. Um, and for those that were wondering, uh, Magneto is able to nullify some of the effects. Basically, I, now I think I don't remember the exact technical way of it, but he's using his powers as a way to kind of create a shield. So that's why her powers can't like affect him like that that's why they can actually interact um so and if you notice during that scene you see like a quick little spark of magneto's powers right under her uh his hand or right under her hand so that's why they're able to do this but i've already told y'all all of this stuff could have been avoided very easily and y'all out here really putting my man gambit through it Look at this. Why my man Gambit got to go through this? Why y'all doing this to him? And and he saw this. He saw her come out of his out of the room. Why y'all do this to Gambit? Why? That's not okay. That's not okay. Gambit don't deserve that. Gambit ain't do nothing to nobody. All Gambit has done has tried to love Rogue with all his Cajun heart. And this is how y'all play Gambit? That's not cool. My man was out here making Bengays for everybody, and Magneto just showed up and took over. He ain't do nothing. But he gonna get that little sugar. He gonna get that sugar all right. Ugh, I feel bad. Anyway, I like this scene right here, though. I love this scene with uh Wolverine and Morph um, because, and, and, you know, I saw people online trying to make this more than it is. Please don't. Like, don't try and force things that are not there. Wolverine and Morph are just friends. But what I like about it is the fact that we got this even in the earlier episode. Wolverine told you why Morph was like one of his best friends. It's because Morph is one of the few people that actually understood Wolverine and was one of the few people that made him laugh. And this was so funny. This scene was so hilarious because he was like, yo, let's grab a beer. Let's eat some snacks because, you know, he's still hurting over the fact that, you know, this this is why Wolverine is still hurting. Right. But Morph already knows how to get Wolverine to get in a better mood. We got to fight. Let's go fight. Let's go. I'm going to be your worst enemy. And Wolverine was like, chink, let's go. <laughs> like, th because they are just that best of friends. I loved that aspect. I love the fact that Morph can joke with Wolverine. He can poke fun at her. Even when they was in the club earlier, he turned, you know, he was changing in the gene and stuff like he gets him. And keep in mind, Morph also understands trauma. This guy has gone through it as well. So the fact that they both can bond and they're both friends about it, I love that camaraderie. Then, of course, we saw Storm. She left the mansion. Um, she is going off somewhere uh, just to live her own life because right now she's a straight up human. No powers, no nothing. So we will see what happens with her moving forward. And then last but not least, we get the knock at the door. And who is it? gene the hell what is going on with that well and that's how they leave us now if that was not a good cliffhanger i don't know what else was but um you know i think uh for a lot of comic fans um we know exactly where it's going um like i said i did see episode three so i can confirm that yes they are going in that uh in that direction um 
And uh, I think that they do a very interesting job with it. But we will talk about that on Wednesday when y'all catch up. Keep in mind, nobody else. Now, be careful um, because uh, a lot of the media folks, you know, we did get a chance to see up to the first three episodes. um, But nobody else is seeing anything after that. So just kind of be careful of certain spoilers. But after episode three, nobody knows what's going on. So we all going to be surprised at the same time. Um, but anyway, um, okay, we have gotten uh, to the end of episode two, so I need to know now what is y'all rating for episode two? Um, I want to, uh, while you guys discuss that, I am going to give you uh, my thoughts on uh, the episode two rating. So, uh, great drama much more emotional not as much action but that's not a bad thing still impeccable writing it is a little bit slower but again that's not terrible or whatnot i think i'm gonna give this one a nine so if the la- if episode one was a nine and a half i'll give this one a nine um because i just thought it was like i didn't see nothing really bad like it was solid overall um, so I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10. Um, but yeah, fantastic series so far. Great writing, great character development. We are revisiting, um, issues that the characters have dealt with thus far. I'm just not here for the rogue situation because that could have been avoided. That's contrived drama. So that's why it's not a 10. I'm gonna take a point off of that. Do my boy Gambit right. Okay. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, let's see what y'all thought though. Y'all gave it a 10, nine and a half, eight and a half, um, 10, um, let's see, nine, six, dang, a six. Wow. All right. Uh, nine and a half, nine, 10, 10, uh, nine and a half, eight and a half, uh, nine and a half, nine, uh, 10. All right. Nine um 8.9889 eight, uh 89 uh 8 and a half okay cool 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 all right so yeah i think we're all set i think we're all set so um i think we could say that so far this series is off to a good start um i'm with it uh i am very happy with what we're doing with where they're going with it um and i think that this is definitely touching the nostalgia vibes like very very well um but uh yeah i'm very happy with where we're going but anyway guys like i said uh we will get back to this um we'll get back to uh going through the episodes uh on wednesdays i think it comes out wednesday at like two o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning whatever stupid time frame that was um but uh we'll get back to doing that and checking those out um and uh yeah i'm i'm looking forward to this i think that this is going to be solid um and they only have you know they can only keep going and hopefully they keep this energy up to the very end um keep in mind that two seasons have already been greenlit so they already have both seasons from bo de mayo um already in the bag so you know hopefully they keep this up um but uh let's see i got a couple comments here uh anthony kobe update i don't have one there's nothing the closest i have no i take that back i do have a wireless e e collar i got an e collar now for him so um i am going to test that out and see where he goes with it now um i'm not going to use it for punishment or anything um but i do think i need to keep it on hand just in case so for example um i'm gonna start off by just introducing it to him slowly um you know i'm just using the vibration i'm not using the sound i'm not using the shock or anything um but i'm gonna kind of get him used to just using the vibration to understand like you know if i call you come and if you don't come this thing is going to keep bothering you until you come so i'm gonna try and you know give him treats and stuff like that just to get used to it but um my man has had another incident he had another incident where uh my niece who spoils him 
he spoils she spoils him um more than us like she picks him up even though i tell her to stop picking him up um you know that that's her mr fluffy kins and all of that stuff um and uh he growled at her like she was going in just to pet him and say goodbye and he he snapped at her like i was upstairs like who's it what is going on so we're already talking about how he getting a little bold with it so i'm like i right, bet bro because he only does that when i'm not in the room when i'm around him he don't do all that stuff even with guests so i'm sitting here like okay i want to see if you're gonna pop off when i got the collar on you i got the remote and i'm upstairs because it's got range we're gonna see if you're gonna act that same way so i'm gonna kind of keep that on my on my person just in case because you know if i'm in another room and he's snapping on the kids or something pfft, bro sit down you know like sit down until i get there so um we gonna again i don't want to have to use it but for his protection because if he bites somebody he's done he's out of here i don't want him to get to that point so i'm gonna hold on to that just in case um but like i said i'm gonna try and train him to use it so i don't have to use it you know what i'm saying um so yeah that's where we're at we're gonna try this uh um we're gonna try this because he getting a little too comfortable snapping on people and i don't like that like you should not be sna no bro nobody hits you you're not in an abusive household there's nothing to be afraid of here you're not a you're not a rescue you know what i'm saying we had you since you was born like what are you snapping at nah man so we gonna we gonna work that out we gonna work that out uh thank you for that uh michael what you got have you seen the rise of hydra trailer and wouldn't mind a live action version of chris evans and john carla esposito in it yes i have seen the um rise of uh hydra trailer that's the captain america black panther thing from 1943 or whatever i don't care don't care did not really care for it too much um the captain america looks weird the t'chaka i don't even think that was t'chaka i think that was t'challa's grandfather um i'm not a fan of the casting um and i'll be honest i think that they could have gotten someone that looked a little bit more african you know a little bit more african you know um probably even an african actor um because i think they got the guy from the walking dead you know to play him and that's not a diss to him i'm just saying he's not the first person i think of and even the way he sounded I was like, I don't believe that you are a Wakandan king. Like, I just did not get that impression. So, um, not a fan of it, and I definitely will not be buying it. So, we'll see. Uh, Larry, uh, why can Rogue touch Magneto and have no adverse effects? I don't remember their affair in the OG series. Um, yeah, so we talked about how basically it's the mad, uh, the magnetism. He's using his powers. But it was not in the OG series. It was in the comics. So, in the comics... Um, there are a lot of different uh, relationships that happen that um, um, we did not see in the animated series, but they did happen. So, um, you know, that that whole rogue Magneto thing, they're they're basing that off of source material, not off of um, what happened in the series uh larry again thank you so much storm was always the leader of the x-men and i love magneto saying my people were oppressed meaning the jewish people and now i fight for my people and it was a double entendre right he was talking about my people the jewish people were oppressed and then he was like i fight for my people the mutants so like because think about it the jewish people that are humans are now oppressing him so he's like yo I fought for y'all and now y'all fighting against me. So now I got to fight for my other, other people, you know? So he meant both of them, right? Like, so yes. Um, but that's good writing. I thought that was really, really solid. JN, Baudemayo turned X-Men into a soap opera. X-Men's always been a soap opera, you know? Like it's always had these like different dynamics and stuff, even in the animated series. Like there's been that love triangle between Logan and Gene and Cyclops. That's not new. That, that you know, that, it's been there you know uh now granted as kids we probably didn't always pay too much attention to it but those elements have been there for a long time um professor x and uh moira remember moira from uh uh muir island or whatever um 
that was a whole love uh, uh love triangle there too you know because he was out there mad as heck that she was with banshee you know he was just like show me to my room <laughs> it just walked like he was mad <laughs> you know so yeah th th this this is not new this is not new this is uh this is not a bold mayo thing this is just emphasizing what was already always there uh let's see 8.5 gambit singing these rogues ain't loyal i like that i like that good stuff um all right thank you so so much for that all right guys i think we are all there um and we are all set. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for taking the time to hang out with your boy. I always, always appreciate it. Um, and like I said, we will be back here to talk about episode three of X-Men 97. Uh, Wednesday night, I'm going to shoot for hopefully seven o'clock. Um, unless I got a screening or something. I don't think I do. Um, but yeah, be on the lookout. I do have some movie reactions that I have to uh, post for you guys. Saw some movies that I'm going to show y'all or at least tell y'all what I thought about them. Um, so just keep an eye out. Um, but again, thank you so much for everybody that showed some love and support. Um, I hope I caught everybody. Hold on. I got my man Terrence Francis, $10 cash app for the return of Storm's Power. Thank you so, so much, brother. I appreciate you. And let's hope she does get them back. Um, and thank you so much for that contribution, man. I really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, same time on Wednesday. And then, of course, we'll meet back here on friday as well um make sure you guys have yourselves a wonderful weekend wash your hands wash your butts be nice to a mutant out there uh until next time guys peace